Welcome to another edition of the RF Video Shoot Interview Series. Today we're joined by none other than Crash Holly, formerly Crash Holly. Yes, I, I, Mike Lockwood now. Yes. Whatever, man, the man with no name. That'd be my name. <laughs> the man with no name. My first question was, uh, how did you decide to get into the wrestling business? Okay, there's a lot of interviews on the internet or people know. I'll make it, I'll make it very clear I decided. I, uh, my friends used to watch wrestling probably about fourth and fifth grade, and I hated it. I hated watching it. I thought it was stupid. You know, and then I started watching... Uh, you know, primetime wrestling. And what really hooked me was Bobby Eaton because he was such a sarcastic bastard. And you could tell it wasn't planned out. It was real, you know, because he's just that damn quick witted. That's what hooked me in. And then the wrestling hooked me. Got into that. And what actually, what I thought I wanted to do is I, I saw Brady Boone. Brady Boone wasn't a big guy. I don't know how big he was, you know, probably my height, maybe, maybe a little taller. Fuck, if he's my height, that's small. All right. You know, I saw Brady Boone. I thought, man, if that guy could do it, I'd like to do it one day. So, uh, that's that's uh, how I got started and, and everything is, you know, I didn't know where to go. I lived in California and I didn't think there was any wrestling schools. There was actually one wrestling school. It was Bud Sawyer's. And I think I was 16 at the time when I called up there. And they were hesitant about taking me. And I'm glad they didn't because I've heard horror stories about Bud Sawyer's. Guys just get the fuck beat out of them. And I'm glad I didn't go there in, in some senses. But later on, uh, I was talking uh, to a guy. I worked as a at a liquor store just stocking shelves. And some guy says, I know about a school. It's Woody Farmer School. It's over in Hayward, which I lived in uh, Pacifica. And I didn't even know the school existed. I said, Woody Farmer? Okay. He says, I said, who else? He says, yeah, Pepper Gomez does stuff over there. I said, okay. So he gave me the number. And then I waited. I got out of high school. And right when I got out of high school, I got a job. I got a job at a lumber yard making five bucks an hour. It was fucking horrible. But I need money for the wrestling school. It was $2,000. So I saved up, and right when I turned 18, I got out of school, I, I signed up for Woody School. So you weren't really a wrestling fan growing up? or I, was, I wasn't at first. At first, I was like, I didn't understand why my friend was so into it, you know, and being in fourth and fifth grade. I was like, why do they watch this shit? You know, and it was on, it was on so much, and they were so dedicated to watching it. I just, I wasn't into it first, but then when I watched Primetime Wrestling, I got hooked. Then I wanted to know about the history of the business. And I went back and I looked at tapes, and I really got an appreciation for the business. I was really hooked up. So basically, you started watching WF at first. That was the first promotion you. Came yeah, I started watching primetime wrestling. First, it's like I, I didn't care for the matches. I was just concerned what what fucking Heaton was going to do. Right. To me, it was so damn funny. But then I started watching it, just like wrestling. I was hooked. I loved watching that shit. Who were some of your favorite guys you liked to watch growing up? Well, I started watching started watching WF. I loved to watch Savage, and it was just the way Savage would move around the ring. You know, it's, it's little things that he had. It wasn't anything particular move wise that he did, but the way his body language was. And that chicken shit heel thing with Elizabeth, he All was right. such a unique character to me. I liked watching Savage a lot. So basically you started training down in California. Started training down in California uh, with Woody, signed up, and I was trained by Boris Givenoff, who, who refereed for, for WWF when they come out to California. He did a little, a little refereeing. I think he broke in the business in 1983 by Woody. Woody broke him in. And then uh, Shane Cody. Who works? Who's still working today? Works for Kurt White out in California. Those are the two people who broke me in. Woody never got in the ring much, but surprisingly enough, May Young too got involved. So May Young was one of the people who helped me too. The fucking May's fucking crazy. So uh, he should beat the fuck out of Young. What was training like? Train training was tough. I got I got the hell beat out of me by by uh, Shane Cody. It was just coming there. Training was like. You know, they didn't take things too slow. They got in the ring and they just like, whatever Shane wanted to do with you. Just beat the fuck out of you. I think that's where I got a lot of my, I think I'm more of a defensive wrestler. I like to sell more than anything else. I like to do goofy shit, but I like to sell more. I'm not really an offensive wrestler, but just through getting the fuck beat out of me and being humbled in that way a lot, you know, that's. Did you ever feel like you wanted to quit at any time? No, or? I never wanted to quit. I loved it. And, and it was. I get off my job at the lumber yard and I drive over the San Mateo Bridge. And if anyone knows the Bay Area, when it comes time when you get off the clock, the traffic's fucking horrible. It's horrible. I sat on that San Mateo Bridge for two, almost two hours a night, maybe a little bit more sometimes, maybe less. I didn't complain once. I went to practice a couple times a week and I loved it. I got the hell beat out of me and just see, you couldn't discourage me. You weren't going to stop me. And I never, that time, it's like I never thought, well, I want to get up. The WWF, yeah, it's a dream. Everybody, I just wanted to do it just to see if I could do it and just to see what that side of it was like because there were so many things I didn't know. You know, you, you think it's fake. You know, you think it's fucking fake by watching, but you're like, man, that shit just got hurt. Some of that shit just has to hurt, but I wanted to know just to see if I could do it. What was the toughest thing that you actually had to go through during training? 
toughest thing I had to go through. You, you know what? To me, to me, it wasn't wasn't anything particularly tough. I mean, taking the bumps, it, it takes toll, and you just man, you take those free, first few bumps. I like watching like the MTV Tough Enough thing where you got those kids and they're so jazzed up, and man, I can do it. I can do anything. Yeah, it's not a problem. And they start bumping in the first couple of days, and they look just like, well, fuck, that's that's not what I thought it was. You know, it was an eye opener to get bumped around and think because man, it looks the guys make it look so easy on TV. You know, and okay, is it a work? Is it not a work? You don't really know until you step in the ring. And the business wasn't as exposed back then as, as it is now. Nothing was particularly tough because nothing was going to kill my spirit. It's like, it hurt. You know, I got beat up. I got bruised. But I was doing something that I wanted to do. You know, and I was learning about something that, that really interested me. I wasn't interested in going to college. You know, I knew, I knew around a certain time, around eighth grade, freshman year, when I was so into it, I wanted to be a wrestler. That's what I want to do. You know, and you get a lot of people who are like, you're never going to fucking do that. And at the time back then, where guys are so big, you know, and someone my size, fucking midget my size, doesn't have a fucking prayer. It's like, I don't care. I just want to fucking do it. You know, that's all I cared about. Did anybody ever tell you you're too small to be a wrestler? Oh, yeah. Fact, plenty of fucking people tell me. You ain't going to fucking make that. Are you fucking kidding me? But that shit, I think a lot of wrestlers get that. More more the, the cruise weights, the fucking midgets like myself. You get that and you're like, all right, that's cool. I'll show you. It yeah. motivates you more. It motivates you more. It just lights that fucking fire on your ass. Like, that's fine. If you say I can't do it, it's, we'll see. You know? Was there anybody that really was helpful early on in your career? Hmm. Bor- Boris Gibnoff was really helpful. Boris Gibnoff was talking to this guy. Who, ah, that was his name. Uh, he wrestled his, I can't think of his name. Boris was helpful because Boris been up there. He'd been in that company. He'd been refereeing. Boris would smart me up to a lot of things about how to act and, and the way to act in the locker room and, and how to keep your mouth shut in certain times and, and what to say. So Boris was very helpful. You know, Shane was helpful too. Shane Cody, getting the fuck beat out of you, it's 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 good for you and it's a humble experience. You know, it's kind of like the tough enough thing where, you know, I watched that. I heard about it where Bob Holly beat up Matt, you know. I want to fucking see this. So I watched the tough enough thing and I'm like, it's a fucking problem. Bob Holly's beat the fuck out of me probably more than anyone. And every time Bob's beat me up, I went back. Thank you, Bob. Shook his hand because that's how you get respect. When Matt's crying in the ring, it's a reality check when Bob did you. But man, Bob's fucking done 10 times worse things to me. And fuck, I love it. You know, what are you going to do? You going to fucking complain? Like Matt wants to cry and complain? Dude, there's a fucking door. Right. Yeah, I just, you don't, that's not the way you get respect in the business. You know, you get your ass handed to you and it's, you come back and learn from that and build off that. You know, that's how you get respect. You know, and memories of uh, I guess your first match. Well, your memories of your first match. Ray's first match was against Boris. Man, I don't know where the fucking tape is. I wish I had. Huh. It was against Boris giving off the, the guy who really helped me out and showed me. And uh, you know, funny enough, I wish I wish I get some copies of that Bay Area wrestling because Chris Jericho came through there. I just like to see that Chris Jericho thing. I, I briefly remember talking to him. He came through. He worked there in a while. It was a cool deal. Bay Area wrestling was on Sports Channel. Uh, in the early 90s when it first started out, it was it had total Bay Area coverage. It was like a Memphis TV show kind of. Right. It was run just like that. It was a really good experience lyric like that. They didn't pay a shit, but I don't give a fucking care. You know, it wasn't a matter when you, you pay us. It was the experience of doing and, and being involved in something like that. Now you worked early on as Johnny Pearson, right? Yeah, I came up with the name Johnny Pearson. It just sounded like a fucking baby. John's my middle name. So right. like, to Johnny, Johnny's just like the total baby face, like in the 80s or just... It's a cheesy baby face. Hey, I got Pearson from Drew Pearson of the Dallas Cowboys. Mm-hmm. I just like the way it sounded. So I came with Johnny Pearson. When did you start wrestling as uh, Aaron O'Grady? Well, I kept, I dislocated my shoulder. First time I did it wasn't wrestling. I, uh, I dislocated my shoulder playing tackle football. I'm like an idiot. You know, you're young, you play without pads. So anyone who's ever had a dislocated shoulder, the more times you dislocate it, the worse the tear gets in your joint. So I dislocated my shoulder and I had to have surgery and I was out. Uh, I was out. And when I was out, Woody's school closed down. So I didn't know where the fuck else to go. You know, I met Mike Modest there. You know, he, he worked for, uh, God, what was his name? I can't remember. My memory's horrible on things. Uh, Jerry Monty. Jerry Monty passed away. I think Jerry Monty worked for WWF. He was a job guy in the 80s. But Jerry Monty was always a good guy. Always got on great with him. I met Mike Modest there. And I heard Mike Modis was wrestling somewhere. I didn't know. Uh, I came up with it with, with uh, I didn't actually come up with the name Aaron O'Grady. I came up with the gimmick of the leprechaun. All right. I had this thing in my head, which would have been actually a great fucking gimmick in the 80s. 
you know? Right. It's a leprechaun, it's a baby face, you come out, you throw chocolate, do the fucking Irish voice, add a fucking red beard. Huh. Like a guy, as a heel, you could fucking, you'd hit people in the head with the pot. I thought it'd be a good gimmick for the 80s, but I thought at the time, maybe you could use it somewhere. So I just had the name of the leprechaun. I met uh, Jason Styles. You know, I, I kept in contact with Jason because Jason Styles went to Woody School and I kept in contact with him. He said he was working for, let me think of his name, Paul, Paul Brown, who has a little, and just small little promotion. It was West Coast Wrestling Alliance. I went to Paul Brown's and he said, Paul, I want you to try out in the ring, just see what you look like, maybe Paul using the ring. So I tried out, I worked with Paul and he was fine. He, he wanted to book me on some of the shows. I said, okay, I told him about the idea I have and I've shipped for money about the stuff. You know, someone came up with the name Aaron O'Grady. They were just using me as Aaron O'Grady. I worked for Paul. Paul only had shows like, fuck, maybe one show every two months or three months. It just wasn't, I wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't meeting anybody in California, and I wasn't going anywhere. California wrestling then it wasn't fucking big. But someone told me about uh, Mike Modest or something. He was working for uh, Roland Alexander in all pro wrestling. I was like, I never even heard of this fucking place. This is in Hayward. And funny enough, it was right up the street from where Woody School used to be. Like one block up. I said, I didn't even know about this. You know, so I think I went over there with, with Jason Styles. I had a I had a trial with Roland. And I got in the ring. Who was there? Uh, Matt Heisman was there at the time. Spike. He was there. And I'd know Mike. I, I didn't keep in contact with him. Mike was cool with me because he knew where I started out. They had a ton of guys there. Just a ton of fucking guys. I had a tryout in front of everyone. Roland let me wrestle Spike in front of everyone. We had the match. Uh, the guy seemed to like me, but Roland just picked me apart. You know, Roland's like, oh, your fundamentals are wrong, and this is wrong, and that's wrong, and you're doing this wrong, and that wrong. And I could see the point where he had some stuff because, you know, I hadn't been wrestling or doing anything, so I could see where his point of fundamentals and doing shows. So I had the trout and, and Roland's like, okay, you can come work in. It was a good place because they had a practice, you know, three days a week, four days a week. So after being there a while, and funny enough, I went over there. Roland's like, well, I'd like you to get some more training here. You know, and I'm thinking, okay, he's going he's gonna to fucking work me for money. Right. You know, here it comes. I'm not ready to pay for another wrestling school because I, I paid for it already years ago. And Roland's thing was, well, all I got to do is pay gym dues. You know, that's Roland's big scam is Jim dues. That's and it, that's his thing. He gets the guys paying 25 bucks or 20 bucks a month after you pay for the school just to keep him paid bills. I'm like, oh, that's cool with that. 20 bucks a month, 25. Okay, I got a place to fucking wrestling. I don't want you to come work with, with Spike, you know, Matt. Matt lived there at the school. So I went there and I worked out with Matt a couple of times. And then when Roland was in and used me, I had my stuff already bought. I have my jacket. I have my fucking pot of gold. I had the whole idea for the gimmick. I pitched it to Roland. And Roland's like, first, eh, I don't fucking know. And I said, I'd like to do it. I think it would work. I, I think it could be something good. You know, so Roland was cool and they let me use it. And I had the leprechaun arrow break. That's where I came up with it. That's right. I found, found the place. What are your early memories of Spike? Spike was a cool guy. You know, Spike's just, just how he is. He's laid back. He's, he was a cool guy. You know, and he fucking, man, he can fucking work, man. You know, he can go. I was so surprised when I went to Roland's. Because going to Paul Brown's or being at Woody's, you know, it really is the credibility of where you're training and who's doing the training. And the funny thing about Rollins is, Rollins not doing the fucking training. Yet. Right. You know, Rollins a guy, you know, he's, he's, he's got a mouth on him. He can talk and he can pitch an idea. And I don't want to say brainwash people, but he can get the vision of this is the way and this is the way it's got to go. And he's a promoter. He's a fucking promoter. So he's good at being a salesman. So it wasn't, it wasn't uh, you know, Roland that was doing the training. It was... It was uh, it was Mike or it was Spike and the other guys. And Precious Spike, I like Spike. I liked him a lot. And pretty much when I got there, we did one show, but then Spike got the deal to go to ECW, so I didn't really get a chance to know him. But just the little bit I did, I like I like him a lot. A lot of people have negative stuff to say about Roland. What was he actually like? Uh, you know, he's there. I remember when when Barry Blaustein, I think, or the guy came around for for the movie. What was it? Beyond the Mat. Beyond the Mat. You know, and Roland comes up. And he goes, okay, we got this guy, Barry Blaustein. Roland always pitches thing. We got this thing, you know, and this, this company's going to be big. He'd always do this big thing where we're going to be big one day. And this is, he'd always be working on stuff. And the, the sad thing I hate that I hate Roland did is that whenever something came across the table, like, oh, I'm going to book some of your guys here, he'd always pump the guys up and shit would fall through. That's what I hate about Roland. He was such a salesman. Like, okay, you got to believe the point. Shit's never going to happen. Roland Alexander and Beyond the Mat is is him to a T. He's, huh. he's, he's, he's a scumbag, you know? There, there's, like I said, it, I respect the fact that I got to start there. 
And I respect the fact where I started, you know, but Roland Alexander, he's a fucking, he's a promoter. He's a slimy fucking promoter. You know, he, fuck, that movie tells it to a T of what he is. And he was so pissed off when that movie came out. Like, I don't look like that. No, you huh. fucking look like that. Not putting words in your mouth. He didn't like the editing of that movie or how it looked. There's a lot of stuff that they took out of the fucking movie that they didn't put in there that they should have. But I think Blaustein didn't want to make him look like a complete fucking scumbag. But he, he is what he is. He's a worker. But Roland, like a lot of people, he doesn't have, he wanted to be a wrestler so bad. So fucking bad he wanted to be a wrestler. And he actually, I think he got trained or maybe he had a truck. I forget what his deal was. You know, he used to hang out with Rocky Johnson. He used to hang out with the guys who worked the cow house. He wanted to be it so bad, but he couldn't. You know, did he always talk about it on some levels? Yeah, he had some good ideas, but on other points, he would fucking do what are you talking about? He would always tell me, You gotta be more of a high flyer. You know, I'll do my role. You gotta be more of a high flyer out there. You know, if I tell you want to make it in the business, you gotta be a high flyer. I don't think that that flies enough. You know, he's gotta learn how to fly and do stuff, and that's what he's gotta do. And you know, the guy's giving advice and beyond the mat about fucking eating and fucking, come on, dude, please. Right. You know, that was, one of, that was actually one of my questions. Uh, what did you think of the way they portrayed him to be on the mat? That's the way. That's yeah. the way he is. Like I went back there. I like, Roland had this thing. This is fucking mind boggling. Huh. Roland has this thing where, you know, the guy's working. You work the shows for him. He takes a percentage of your gimmick money. You know, and this shit doesn't happen usually anywhere else. You know, Roland wants to take a percentage. Bushwhackers came in and worked the show for him. I wasn't there at the time, but Roland wanted to take the cut of the fucking gimmick. Are you fucking kidding me? Are you gotta be kidding me. I went there. The only time I worked back for Roland's when I started up here. I started up in the company I used to work for. I don't work there anymore. Uh, when I started up there, Donovan called me. He says, you want to come just do an autograph session? This is right when I was pretty much like four or five months into working for WWF at the time. He goes, you want to come up there and work? I said, fuck, man. It was close to my house. I went there. I did really good in gimmick sales. I took eight by tens and fucking signed autographs. I did really well. And Roland was pissed. I didn't give him none of the money. Well, you didn't even have to advertise me. I just showed up out of nowhere just to do it. I did it for him twice. I had really good both times. And that just left an ill taste in my mouth that, like, I owe you money. I don't fucking owe you anything. The philosophy, I think, is that Roland has, well, I trained you. Or pretty much since you went here, and you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to get where you want if you didn't have this place to work. So, therefore, I, you should give me some of your money. You know, he didn't try that shit with me. He did that shit with Vic Grimes where when we got our contracts, our developmentals, he wanted some of Vic's money, you know? He'd have the balls to ask me for any fucking money, right. you know? And he would never have the balls to ask me for the Polaroids to give me. He would tell the other guys, oh, I don't think that's right. I don't think you should give some money. And the boys were like, you're not going to get the fucking money. Are you kidding me? You know? What were the uh, APW Garage Gym Wars? APW Garage Gym Wars was, was something, man. You know, it was... <sighs> All the guys there at APW, there wasn't... To me, at least, when I worked there, there wasn't any politics. Everybody wanted to go out and have good matches, to have a good time. We started Jim Wars. Rowan had this thing. You know, he had this, these fucking, he had this thing where he had this idea, these fucking, I think there was maybe, I don't want to say 12, there was 10 guys, and they were fags. And Rowan says, we want to put a show on for them. They like that violent ECW type stuff, and we want to do a show in our garage, and they're going to pay money to come watch and, and everything. And so the boys are like, show for fags right. and everything and I don't know about this. <laughs> Roland's like, well, we'll be good because we could do a show here. We don't, you know, we don't gotta pay for a place to ride in the garage. You can invite your friends. You know, so we start first started doing gym wars. Um, we don't think we had shit for people to show up for that first one. Something fell through like the guys were gonna pay us a bunch of money. I'm sure maybe Roland got the money. We didn't see shit. Right. You know? So we started doing gym wars and I think we were doing them I don't know if we did them every other month at first. And then we started doing it once a month. And people started coming. And Roland's like, I'm going to charge $5. And this is the same shit. When I heard this, I'm like, you're going to lose people because this is the stuff that Woody Farmer used to do. We used to have our television tapings that were free. And you'd stuff like, man, maybe 75 people in the studio. And then once once Woody started to charge people, nobody came. So I thought, here we go. No one's going to come because we're starting to get a, you know, a few people to come. So like, Roland's like, I'm going to charge 5 Then he charges 5 Then he charges 10 Then he charges 15 and we're getting more and more people to come. You know, it doesn't seem like a lot to have 125 or maybe, God, they cram 150 people in there. Probably less than that. We'll be around there. It doesn't seem like a lot. When you have that every two weeks, and to be involved in something finally where you have storylines and angles and characters and you have booking that is fun, that makes sense, that 
that there's no politics or backstabbing and everyone's having a good time and you get people showing up, man, that's fucking fun. You know, it's like we did something and it's not a lot of people fucking 150 but from starting from nothing and then drawing those people and we actually wanted to do, we actually could have went up to, to work a, an armory right up the street. I think all they wanted was concessions. Right. And they said, you can have any boss. It would have been such a good deal and I think we could have built maybe three or 400 people constantly every two weeks because we were turning people away because there were so many fucking wow. people coming. It was so exciting. And rolling fuck that, it's like, I'm not letting them take my, you know, fucking concession money or some shit, you know? So it's like, that guy screwed up. Working that, working that gym wars was, was such a good experience because we were so into, at least a lot of the guys, watching the Japanese tapes, man. Watching Sawa and watching the Japanese, and just, man, the way those guys would sell in Japan, you know? And that's where I really worked, learned a lot of my psychology of things, of how to work and how to put a match together. You know, you can't learn by doing shit once or twice a month. You know, you learn by having something more constant, which to me was more constant than anything. You know, I have good fond members of that place. But man, we used to just, I mean, man, we beat the fuck out of each other. But no one held back and it wasn't that anyone was being a dick because everybody was pretty much friends with everybody and everybody got along. And man, everybody was on everybody's side. Let's fucking have a good show, right. which you don't hardly see that anywhere. You know, everyone had a camaraderie there. Let's fucking do this. It's good and it's exciting. I like the booking there. I like the storylines. I like the matches and stuff. You know, it was a very good experience for me. Who was responsible for the booking? Was it Roland? For, for what booking? Uh, that, that it was it was Roland and it was Mike, you know. Then they let you know. I got in there and I had ideas. They listened to me, but pretty much it was Roland and Mike, All right? You know. But I mean, I, I listened to their booking meetings and ideas. And Roland asked, "What do you think about this?" Mike was saying, "I don't know about that." You know, I think Donovan got in there too, you know, and just bouncing ideas and and doing stuff. So I mean, it was it was fun just to watch that process because I never watched that process and hearing Roland talk and then okay, this happens here and then watching the matches and watching some of the angles go was really exciting because I've never seen that in years. Right. So, fuck, it's fun to be involved in something like that. What are your early memories of Vic Grimes? Oh, Vic Grimes, fuck. Vic, Vic is somebody who just he he could have made a lot of money in this business because somebody liked him, you know. That's how I got my trial was through, through WWF, through, through Vic Grimes. You know, Vic was someone, he was a big mark for fucking Cactus. You know, he's a huge mark for him. That's why he wore the mask and he wanted to take a million bumps. Vic, Vic was amazing because he couldn't hurt the fucking guy. You know, he would take a bump in the cement, he wouldn't get hurt. You know, but his, his one worst enemy, and he'll even admit this today, I've read some interview, he just doesn't fucking listen. You know, we tell the guy, please don't do that. This is why you should do that. Or don't do this. This is why you shouldn't do this. I mean, Vic was off the fucking wall when I met him. Just some of his ideas and you actually have conversations with him. And you're sitting there and you're talking and then you're just sitting there going, all right, you know. Vic wouldn't hurt you in the ring. You know, to me, I never got hurt working with the guy in the ring. I enjoyed working with him. I mean, if it wasn't for working with Vic, it was actually Jim Cornette who saw the tape. It was... J.R. Benson did stuff with Roland, you know. And uh, J.R. Benson and Ron Head, I think Ron Head huh. went to OBW, huh. right? Ron Head and J.R. Benson knew Cornette. You know, I know they knew him, but it didn't, nothing registered to me because I'm out in California and we're just doing these shows. And actually, for Roland, we, when we do shows at high schools and stuff, he'd draw fucking good, man. We did a show one time, I forget where it was, like 1,200 people, 1,100 people. That's fucking good. You know, we didn't have anybody on the card except us. But, but Vic, it's like Vic just, he, he wouldn't fucking listen, you know? It just it was amazing to me. And I remember I was at the point where, I'm sure you bring up ECW stuff, but just to bring this up, I was at the point where I've been working a number of years and I wasn't getting anywhere. I'd send tapes out. I wasn't getting any response. I couldn't make any good connections. I enjoyed where I was, but I was like, man, I just, I like to get a trial to just try to venture out but i didn't have any money to go anywhere i didn't really make any good connections because no one was coming in to work for roland you'd get some guys but it was like now where you get on the east coast so like i remember with vic and he was such a bullshitter about things you know he just he talked these wild fucking stories like yeah, all right fucking vic it's just be a vic being an idiot but i remember i was at the point to where you know i wasn't ready to quit doing this because i enjoyed it but i was frustrated because i just wanted to get a deal try out somewhere you know i thought Man, I, I have enough talent, you know. I, I thought I could get something going somewhere. I remember Vic calling me and saying, Hey, man, do my Vic. Hey, uh, uh, Jim Cornette, man, he wants to, he, he saw a tape of us, and that's where I heard. He, he wants to give us a try when WWF comes in. I'm like, Vic, dude, I don't got time for your shit, dude. 
You know, because right. he, he tells stories, not harmful stories to fucking where you're lying, but just those exaggerated stories like, you know, if you go fishing, you catch a fish, it's one pound. By the time you talk to Vic, it's a fucking shark, right. you know? So Vic tells me, yeah, Cornette wants to give a straw. I'm like, dude, Vic, dude. no fucking way. Come on. But uh, sure shit, this is, uh, and I think before I left for ECW, I had someone calling me and I said, you give Jim Cornette talking on my voice. I'm like, this is fucking real. You know, and sure enough, fucking Cornette's in the phone, and he's so fucking excited. He's like, man, I saw tape of you and Vic. Match you had, that fucking match is incredible. Man, I want to get you guys a trial. I don't know when we're coming out to California. When we come out there and get you a trial, I'm like, huh. what the fuck? Was this the False Count Anywhere match? It's the False Count Anywhere match. Right. You know, we just fucking just murdered each other in the match. I hit him with the car. And that that's the, the rib on that. It's like, man, I wonder if I get fucking hit Vic with the car for fucking do the Jerry Lawler thing. I, mean, hit him. I hit him with the car door, though. But, that, man, Vic don't feel shit. You know, Vic's always protected me in the ring. He's never stiffed me. You know, he's always been very professional, but just Vic Grimes as an individual is his own worst enemy because he'll just shoot himself in the foot, you know? But if it wasn't for, I, I realize these things on a point. I would know if I didn't have the match with Vic, then Cornette would have solved the tape. Everything works out for a reason, but, you know, it, it's funny with Vic that I know he's very, Vic saying we got signed, you know, he thought he's going to be the next mankind. Man, I'm going to be the next mankind. And so they're pumping him up. And that's why they sent us to Memphis to work, right? And Vic would get, we went down there and Vic would get promos and he'd do stuff. And he was the fucking real indie. Yeah, you got, got to do it like this and you got to do it like that. I'm like, Vic, I don't even fucking get promos. I think I had one promo in right. Memphis Power Pro. And I didn't know what the fuck to say. They gave me no direction. I was like, what do I say, right? So I think, I think Vic toward me, I haven't spoken with Vic in years. But I know that pisses him off that I did the hardcore thing up in WWF because he thinks that was his fucking deal. So in a way, it's like he thought he was going to get that so fucking bad and that I ended up with that. And he, he thinks, well, I could have done this. I can't believe he did this. You know, so I mean, I, I wouldn't have a problem talking to Vic or Workwoods. And he just, I wish he would have shut his fucking mouth because he created so many fucking enemies. You know, he knows that too. You know? Was there anyone else in APW at the time that you thought had real star potential? I modest it. Without a doubt, modest. He he was his work was just fucking incredible. You know, I, I'm glad he got the thing. He had he had tryouts with 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 WWF and just it, it's weird that the company's weird. It's like I remember, man, it, wrestling business. The more I'm around it, the more the only thing I know it's who you know and likes you. You know, that's how it works. Right. To me, that's how it works. That that really rings in my ear. Mike would come in. Mike had a tryout. He I think he worked with Tony Jones or something. Maybe it was Robert Thompson. He had a couple of tries up there, and then he had the thing at WCW worked Christopher Daniels, and he had a deal. He just, for one reason or another, he would never get a break. Someone like Christopher Daniels, too, he wrestled Taka in a fucking dark match. The match was incredible. I mean, he stole the fucking show. Right. Why they wouldn't sign Daniels is beyond belief to me. I don't know. He always had good matches when he'd come in there for tries. It's like, no one likes Chris. You know, if somebody liked him, he would have a job. That's how, that's how the wrestling business works. That's how it worked. Cornette. We had our tryout in UC Davis it was on January 18th or 17th. I've never seen this since I've been there in trial. We get there, right? And I'm fucking so nervous because I know tryouts, you don't get them that often. Here I am, you know, been working since 89, trying to fucking make way. We get there, I'm so fucking nervous. I've met, never met Cornette, you know. I'm stressed with that. Here comes Cornette. I'm like, oh, fuck. Cornette says, guys. Here's the deal. Gonna give you, gonna give you, actually it was the first time was when Tyson was coming in and doing stuff. Actually it was the first time we showed up to the place we didn't get to do it. But the second night I knew we were going for short corner. I said, only give you guys six, seven minutes, you do whatever the fuck you want to do. Whatever the fuck, whatever the fuck you want to do. Now, I didn't know anything about trials, but I know that in dark mass trials, uh, Vic, Vic Grimes, he sat me in a chair on the outside. No one, I've never seen anyone do this, let alone up there. He did a liger flip over the top and crushed a chair. No one goes outside and grabs shit. Dark match is up there. You stay in the ring. You don't go outside. You don't fuck around because they just want to see fundamentals right. up there and just how the guy looks. We had free reign to do whatever the fuck we want. That was, was amazing to me because I've never seen anybody get that, you know, especially grabbing a chair and fucking laying on a chair. But Vic crushed that fucking metal chair and got right up, you know. Um, Michael Maldis, back to Michael Maldis. Some of your memories of working with him. Mike, Mike a great fucking worker. He just, he, he's, he's, there was just something about him I could tell. You know, he's just so tremendously talented for one reason or another. He couldn't, he couldn't get a fucking break. But I had good matches with Mike. I liked the matches I had with Mike. Meltzer would come down a lot. It was interesting. Meltzer would come down and watch Jim Morris. He'd put the matches over and he'd do stuff. Interesting thing about Meltzer is, you know, 
and, and I don't know if you're going to talk about the internet if you want to talk about that. I'd like to say something about that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You can talk about it now if you want. Okay, yeah. So Here's the thing about Meltzer. Meltzer would always come and put our shows over, put our work over, put the guys, because the guys, we, we were starting, we were starting to do that Japanese psychology and learning stuff. We drew a crowd for that because it was different, you know? And we had some good talent there, and, and Mike was fucking good. Meltzer came and put the show over all the time. And the interesting thing about Meltzer was he would talk about, I remember when I first started up in WWF, Dave Meltzer said, you know, it's Crash Holly character. After a couple weeks up there and just Bob beating on me, Dave Meltzer said, hey, it's Crash Holly character. He's not going to have much shelf life. I'm already bored with him. The thing about Meltzer, here's the thing about the internet, something that, man, it's kind of like that thing when I was watching Dr. Phil before <laughs> you guys came in. And thing about Dr. Phil, it's kind of like the thing about the internet. When Dr. One of Dr. Phil's comp, uh, one of Dr. Phil's, uh, I was reading the paper, actually, the topic of Dr. Phil was he gives women advice on how to get along with other women. Hold on a second. Wait. Dr. Phil's a fucking man. How can Dr. Phil tell a woman how to get along with another woman? How can Dave Meltzer... Now, I don't know if Dave's ever wrestled. You know? Has Dave ever wrestled? I, I don't know. Okay, it's the same thing with a lot of people on the internet, you know? Yes, you want to know what the fans want. You know, what percentage is the internet community as far as for your fan base? I don't know. You know, yes, their percentage. Yes, you want to listen to them. But it seems that a lot of the internet people, they bury shit so hard. And it's not that you're not allowed to bury shit, but where's your credibility? If you never step between the fucking ropes like Dave has, how can you be so judgmental on the guys? Well, I think this is a three-star. Because, number one, if I told you, if I went up to Dave Meltzer and said, Dave, let's put a mask together. Would Dave have a fucking clue? Dave wouldn't have a clue, or the people on the internet wouldn't have a clue, because unless you wrestle, and I was told this by Boris, and it didn't make sense to me at the time. When you start to wrestle and get a lot of experience, you're going to learn to feel the crowd out there. You know, it didn't make sense to me at the time because it didn't have shit for experience, but now since I've been doing it a number of years, I can feel the crowd out there, and I know. And, and Dr. Tom Pritchard, I love Dr. Tom to death. When he has his seminars and stuff, and he tells the guys to have matches, if you can't see the match in your head, you can't feel it inside your head. You can't go out and do it in the rain. You know, people on the internet and stuff. Yeah, you can criticize, but fuck, why don't you do it? If if you, if you can do it better than me or some of the guys, please sign up for a school because God knows the wrestling business needs help right now. You know, business is down. Quit being a fucking armchair wrestling fan and get in there and help. You know, that's my opinion. People on the rest, they're they're so. And here's the thing: it's like uh, fucking Steve Rich is my best friend, and he talks about all the time. He's like. You know, wonder if the Star Trek marks sit there and go, God, they're fighting the Borg again. How many times can they fight the Borg? Here comes the Borg again. They're going to write detailed reports of the Star Trek thing. If you hate the show so much, why do you put so much effort into writing fucking details about it? You must not hate the show. Right. You know? Like, characters on the show, too. People constantly, I read shit, because I like to read shit just to see what people are thinking. You know, and people will bury Rikishi. Oh, Rikishi's fucking horrible. Rikishi's horrible. Well, if you look at the crowd, they're reacting to what he's doing. Why should he change it? You know? You may not like it because it seems like, okay, I don't like it. I've already seen it, but the people read it up. You know, even fucking, even Triple H, when he did something, he talked about the internet where he said, you know, the internet's so negative. You might have two people who don't like what the fuck is going out there. So they tap, tap on their computer and the people read that. Oh God, the show was horrible. No, it wasn't. There was fucking everybody else going crazy. So the internet, it's, it's opinion. Everybody can have opinions. Fuck, you can line 10 of the boys up right here and you're going to get 10 different opinions on what works, what doesn't, but the boys have credibility because they've been in the ring, you know? The people on the internet, man, maybe they want to be wrestlers so bad, they either try to create their heel persona or whatever they try to do, but but reading some of that shit is, man, if you, like I said, if you could do it better, please fucking sign up for a school or get involved because there's a ton of places to do it and stick your ideas in. Fuck, help me out. Help me fucking make sense of it. Huh. Donovan Morgan, remembers while uh, working with him. Do I remember Donovan when he started out and just being green, and I love Donovan's fucking attitude, and just seeing him improve, and seeing him fucking work on shit, getting him fucking awesome. The shape Donovan used to be in, the shape he is now, to the shit he's done, and, and man, just just thinking about that. I mean, I, I'm so lucky. I just wrestling is the right place, right time. So you know, I got real lucky with just having the match I did with Vic, and the kind of shit we did, and then. Corn had seen it and shit just falling into place. But all of us sitting there watching the Japanese tapes and watching Masawa and shit and just being marks watching that shit and the fact those guys are over there working for him, you know, I'm happy for those guys. You know. Describe to the fans uh, what at the time was called the shot heard around the world. The shot heard around the world? Let me think about this. Is this a car or is this, what is this? 
I think it was the was it the chair shot maybe? I'm not positive. Was it the chair? I thought it was the car. And if it was, it was the match with me and Vic, or what it could have been. If it was a shot heard around the world, if that's what it was, it was a match with me and Vic where it was a false count anywhere match. We started the ring, we went to the parking lot, we went to the street, went around, and then I had the thing where I had my 87 Toyota Corolla. And that thing, I, I, you know, I'm such a fucking, I'm such a Memphis fan. You know, I'm, I'm a huge Memphis fan. I remember the thing where Law got hit by the car and I thought, I'm like, another thing, I'm not a rib on Vic. I wonder if Vic's stupid enough to let me hit in the car. Oh, you hit me in the car, you know? Like, I don't want to run you over, Vic. How about I just, if you're there, I hit you and just keep the door open my foot and just run the car into it. So I think that was the shot heard around the world, you know? ECW, how'd you uh, get contact? I got contact with, with ECW to where Spike was doing good there. You know, Spike was in there and, you know, fuck, guys were so happy. One of our guys was going there. I was really fucking happy. I think Modest was sending tapes to Spike and Spike gave the tapes. Well, I think Taz saw, saw the tape. I don't think he liked Modest because Modest threw a lot of suplexes. That's Taz's thing. Okay. But I think they saw me and they said, well, what about this fucking guy? You know? Uh, I think Spike called me and said, Taz is going to call you up. Taz called me up and they, they offered to come out there with me. Okay, I'll come out there. I had my dad's RV. I drove it all the way across country. You know, or actually the thing broke down all the way out there. I called them, told them it wasn't a problem. And that's how things got started out there. Your debut, I think you worked Just Incredible in uh, New Britain, Connecticut, right? Yeah, we were Just Incredible in New Britain, Connecticut. I was really happy. Justin was, I knew Justin was their guy. They're pushing, but Justin was fun. PJ's fucking great. I love PJ, you know, and he was, and PJ's like, oh, he still is. He's always paranoid, you know, like, oh, man. <laughs> he just, PJ was great, you know, as he, he, he let me do anything he wanted to do, and I, I thought I liked the match, you know, I liked with PJ. I just worked in that crowd, and that was such an experience because they're so fucking rowdy, you know, and I hear I am the new guy, and they're going to shit all over me, which is fine, you know. I, I liked the match, came to back, Paul, he was happy with the match, Shane said something about Shane Douglas, you know, so I was like, okay, cool, this, this is, something's happening here. I was glad I went good. Memories of your dark match, at, I believe, November, remember, 97? Oh, yeah. The, the dark match, it's like, uh, what was it? It was me and Paul Diamond, Paul Diamond against Chris Chetty and Spike. Spike. Uh, remember the dark match? It was, it was such an experience to work in front of a, a crowd like that. You know, uh, think about the ECW. I've never seen the Taz ECW show, you know, and I know that if you want to talk about that, I get along great with Taz and Bubba now. Fuck, and I get along excellent. I'm sure you talk to them, they'll probably laugh when they, they talk about me. The thing at the time when I came into to ECW is that they wanted me, Taz wanted me to go to the school and be trained to school. Not to pay to go there, just to go there and show up and be trained. I'm like, okay, I'll be trained. Uh, I talked to Bubba about this. Bubba's attitude says ECW was a belief, a belief that a lot of guys had, and you just weren't on the same page with us. You know, their belief was, and I see their point of, they built something. We did something at APW. We got 150. They built something fucking huge. You know, they built something. They reinvented the business with ECW. So here comes this new guy. Who the fuck is he? You know, they're gonna. It's their place. They built it. It's their way. I just couldn't win with those guys. You know, I couldn't do any fucking thing right. You know, I was. You know, they weren't. They weren't paying me much. That didn't matter for me because man, that was a step. That was a step to go somewhere. Uh, night before, night before the pay per view, all the guys were partying and fucking everything. I drank, I passed out. You know, they got fucking hot. They had every right to get hot of me and everything. It's just funny how things work out. It just, I went home from there. I left from ECW because I knew I had a tryout coming up. Jim Cornette already called me before I went to ECW. Jim Cornette was like, "Don't fucking sign anything with Paul. You got fucking deal. Don't you have this tryout with Vic?" So I knew I had that in my back pocket, and just I couldn't. You know, I'll, I'll take blame for the shit I did wrong there. I just, if people get to know me, I think you talk to Bob and Taz, they know me well enough. They'll fucking, they'll put me over. I think they will. You know, most of the guys fucking do because I'm really easy to get along with. Right. Just, I wasn't on the same page. I wasn't, to me, in my mind, it's like, I'm no fucking veteran. I've been doing almost 14 years. I still don't look as myself as any veteran. And when I came there, I just didn't feel like I should be one of their students, you know. But to them, it was their way. It's going to be their way, whether it was the wrong way or right way. This is the fucking way it is. And I just, I couldn't win. Did you have inter any uh, interaction at all with Paulie at the time? Paulie talked to me when I wrestled uh, Justin. He liked the match. He, he really put the match over with Spike. You know, he liked the fucking match. You know, it was Paulie's idea for the dark match, but Taz didn't like the idea. I got the dark match. I just need Taz's point. Guys have been here longer before you guys deserve the dark match. I'm just a new place. Like, fuck, man. I, 
You know, I can't fucking win, especially you go out and you get fucked up and you're drinking and you pass out, you know. I haven't talked to Mike yet. I don't know how Mike feels about me. He was fucking hot on me. And if you're right to be, you know. Uh, the interaction with Paulie, Paul was always great to me. He was cool. He was, a, you know, he, he, he put stuff over. He put stuff over the match. He liked it. I felt, okay, this is cool. But it just, I didn't feel like, I just felt if I stayed there, it's just going to be problems. Probably going to get the fuck me out of me. It wasn't the move for that. I had a trial coming up. So I called Paul. I couldn't get a hold of him, but I left Paul a message. I said, things aren't working out for me here. You know, I like to talk to you. Paul never called me back. That's fine, but I, I left a message, you know. Should I have done a face-to-face -face with Paul and said stuff? Yeah, probably. You know, did I handle myself right? Probably not, but that's just the process of learning business. You know, do I take from that and learn from my mistakes there? Sure, I made a ton of mistakes there, you know. I think, you know, what do you do? It's just, when, just what do you do when you make mistakes? Do you learn from them? I remember when you left, you did an interview and uh, you called ECW a garbage promotion. We did that. You know what the thing is? I didn't even know what Mike and Donovan were going to do. Roland had the fucking idea to do it. Right. You know, I barely remember. You have that. I know you sell that. Probably. You know, I think you said that. I, I barely remember doing the interview and I don't remember. It. I did have no idea Mike and Donovan were going to come out and do that. You know, I had no idea. To say stuff, to, to knock the promotion is obviously you, you just do shit like that to, to create controversy. You know, they're obviously fucking, they're so successful in what they built, you know, so, so on top. But at the time, I'm pissed and yeah, you want to throw a shot in them, you know, you just throw a fucking shot. You know, you can't argue with the success the company had. Fuck, man, they had so much success. All right. How did the uh, House of Hardcore compare to the APW school? House of Hardcore. I wasn't there when Perry was there. I've heard stories about mm -hmm. that. Very disciplined, very firm. They'll, they'll, they broke the fucking guys in the way they went to broken. was very disciplined. They're going to beat the fuck out of you. And people don't understand that about wrestling schools. Some schools are like that, you know. In the end, if you stick with it, you look back, and those experiences can make you better. House of Hardcore was just... It, it was it was discipline. It was Taz's way. It's the way he did it. You can't argue with that. You know, it was different than APW where no one's beating the fuck out of you. People are just talking. It's kind of like the difference between Al Snow and Bill DeMott. You know, Al Snow's a certain way and he, he takes an interest and talks a certain way. Bill takes things another way. Just like Taz. Taz does things another way. It's his way. It's his way of breaking people in and discipline and breaking you down and humbling you. You know, it's completely different. It was night and day. What did you think of Mikey Whipwreck? I thought Mikey was cool. Mike was cool with me, like I said, until I, 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 the thing happened, he had every right to be pissed at me. You know, Mike is a guy who's been there a fucking long time. He, he paid his dues there. I, I have no problem with talking to him. I haven't talked to these, spoken with these guys in years, so especially with Mike, I don't know how he feels about me or if he's still pissed at me or that man's a long time to fucking hold on. He's got something else going on. Yeah. So I thought Mike was a cool guy. Did you have heat with Chetty also at the time or... Nothing. No, I remember. I hung out. I love Danny Dorn. Danny was fucking hilarious. Danny and Chris Chetty, I, I rode with them, and they were fucking hilarious. I love those guys. How did you and uh, Taz make up? Was it when you went to WWE? Or? Yeah, Taz, it was funny because I, I got up there, you know, and Bob, like I said, working with Bob and, and the accolades right away and just getting the fuck beat out of you. But doing the thing, like I said, talk about the thing with Matt and Tough Knock. You get respect in the business. And Bob Holly talked about this where if you get hurt out there, fucking cares. You know, everybody's hurt all the time. I don't go up to the guys and talk about my injuries because you don't do that. When you get hurt up there, you get respect by shaking someone's hand and thanking them. Or, you know, you can handle it another way. If someone's a problem within the ring, you can dish it back in the ring, obviously. I, I just, when people do stuff to me and I just... I got a lot of respect from those guys up there just because I got my ass handed to me so much by the acolytes and guys and Bob and, and, and just being um, just nice and, and humble. What do you want me to do? Okay, cool. It was funny when Taz was coming up there. I remember that. And uh, I was talking to Stevie. We were like, oh, fuck, here comes Taz. You know, because we knew how he was in ECW. You know, and here he comes. And it was funny because Bob Holly knew the story. I told Bob the story. And the guys up there the story, well, Taz isn't stupid. You know, it was in uh, New Jersey. No, it wasn't in New Jersey. It was Long Island. First time at Taz, and there at Kayra, and I see him, and it's like, you don't know what kind of reacts. And Taz says, hey, um, talk to you. And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, hey, uh, you'll be cool with everything? Cool? And I'm like, yeah, I'm cool. You know? Taz is smart enough to realize that, you know, I don't know if, if you're talking to him, that he's he's the new guy in the new place, and he can't hold grudges. And now, since he's coming to a new company, you know, how am I going to act towards him? You know, from what happened there? Am I pissed about that? I'm not pissed about that. You know, I just... Me, personally, I don't, you know, you can't get along with everybody, you know. My biggest thing is, are you going to be professional in the ring with me? Taz and Bubba, for the shit that happened, you see, I mean, and they come up to the company, have always been nothing but professional in the ring. 
That's that's no fucking bullshit. They never tried to stiff me, never tried to fucking do anything. And sure, they could have, you know, never done that. I put them all very professional. I, I could get along with those guys. Absolutely great. Basically, was there anybody uh, before you went to WWF that was very helpful in ECW with you? <sighs> very helpful in ECW? They have those practice sessions before the shows. Tracy Smothers, maybe? Tracy Smothers. Tracy was cool as hell, man. You could pick stuff up. And I wish I wish it would have worked out there at ECW because I think I could have learned a different aspect of the business. You could learn you could learn from so many different personalities and guys with experience and just, you know, being a sponge and, and being quiet. And maybe that's where more of, until somebody knows me, I'm pretty quiet, you know? And some people might take that as standoffish or maybe Taz might have took that. I've never spoken to Taz about it. I never really went to depth about it. Maybe they took my quietness. And sometimes in the wrestling business, when you're in a locker room, when you're quiet, it's perceived as you're an asshole or you're fucking conceited. Right. You know, I'm very big, and I've always very big on shaking hands. You shake someone's hand, hello, introduce yourself, you don't know them, you shake their hands goodbye, you smile after the match, you thank them. That fucking bugs me when people don't shake hands. Shake a fucking hand. You know, that's me. It's so like ECW, I wish I could have worked out there longer. I mean, in the end, I, it worked out for me anyway, but I could have learned a lot there. Did Paulie ever promise you anything when he first came in or no? Paulie never promised me shit. Okay. You know, but I just promised to come in and I'll get work there. That's all I was promised. And like I said, I have to come in there and prove myself. I have to have a good match or two and then, okay, you can work and then we can do something. Paulie didn't promise me anything. Now you had your uh, tryout, I guess. It was raw February of 98, correct? Yes, February 98. I thought it was January. Maybe it was February. Could be, could be January. I'm sure. It was January. It was at UC Davis, I'm pretty sure. You know, like I said, we had free reign to do whatever the fuck we want to do. So we have the match and... Actually, putting the match together, I knew we had the match. Cornette told us we were going to have, I think, prior to that. Maybe he told Vic, Vic or something we are going to have for him. Because we, we practiced the match, you know, before we went up there. We were going to have 67 minutes. And Vic wanted to do so much shit in the match. I'm like, you know, and Mike was there, helped put it together. He was like, it's too much. And I'm like, it's too much, Vic. Well, you know, we did a lot in that match. You know, it, we, we did a, from Vic doing the Liger flip to me. I do, I do a lot of shit in that match. I don't even do anymore before. You know, because to me, when I go up there... The, the wrestler I am now is not the wrestler I was before because working up in WWF, to me at least, you do what's required to get the person over or the angle over. I don't have to flip out and fly and do a bunch of different shit, you know, because I learned to work smarter, maybe just because I'm old, you know. Uh, the trial was, was so fucking, so much pressure. You know, I feel absolutely sick to my stomach because first impressions are everything, especially up in that company. So we put that match together thinking, man, okay, what could we do? We had like three or four things that we didn't do that, that not that we needed to, but I knew if we threw much in there, okay, we'll try to put the match together with some form of psychology, but we knew watching programming up there, we were going to do moves that no one's seen up there before, you know, because they got some pretty creative fucking moves that only mean a few of the other guys would take. You know, okay, Vic's got this, I'll take this, you know. Vic's the kind of wrestler where he looks best, much like a lot of wrestlers, when a cruiserweight's bumping around for him, you know. Vic will take sick bumps, but if you bump around and doing the stuff for Vic, he looks good. So we knew putting the match together, we try to put the match together psychology, even though we're not going to get much. But if we throw a lot at them, they can always tell us to calm down down the line, which is the point of saying it's to Memphis and they're trying to learn that style, you know. What did the road agent say to you, and who was it? We came to the back, and, and it was fucking... It was Bruce Pritchard in the gorilla and Bruce saw great job, guys. Great job. I think someone else, maybe Sarge might have said something. Good job. Taka put me over. He said, good match. One of the other guys said something to me. And obviously the match wasn't designed for me to get a job. The match was designed for Vic to show Vic that he could take sick bumps and do some. The match was actually, I never thought I would get a fucking job. You know, it'd be nice if I could. It was actually for Vic to get a job because Cornette loved him because they obviously thought he could be. The next man kind. It was just really surprising. We went out to dinner that night afterwards. And I was happy with the match. Fuck, I was tremendously happy. You know, Vic was all excited because like, oh, they're he was pretty confident. Man, I hope they like it. They just signed me. And no one thought they would fucking sign me. Because obviously that company hasn't done at the time we're gonna do something with the cruise weights. They're not doing anything and it's a big man sport. You know. How long after that did you guys get your uh, contracts? We got our contract, I think they might have called two, three weeks later. Were you surprised? Yeah, I was really fucking surprised. I was shocked because I, I could not believe it, you know? But then I thought to myself, well, we must have did something they must have liked, and maybe they have an idea for, for me as far as for being a cruise weight. So they got a couple guys up there. Maybe they got an idea. Bruce Pritchard called us up. Or actually, so I think it might have been Bruce calls up. We're going to offer you developmentalists. We're going to send them to you. And I'd like to send you guys to Memphis eventually to work. 
you know, we don't know when yet. So we sat home for a while working gym wars and stuff and working the shows till we got the call. And, and Bruce says, you guys just you know, drive down to Memphis so you got a car and get yourself an apartment and get your shit. And, you know, you're going to work for uh, Rand Hales and Memphis Power Pro. Now, when you guys did Dory Funk's dojo, was that before or after this? Actually, that was before. I've been thinking about that. I forgot about that. They, it was in your group, by the way. Yeah, they. Uh, who was in the group? Yeah, it was, it was me, Vic, uh, Tiger, Gangrail. Uh, it, was. it was the second group up there in Canada. Actually, we sat home for a while. Then we did the Dory Funk thing. Then we went back home, and then we went to Memphis. I forgot about that Dory thing. Let me think who else was in that group. Uh, the big guy, what's his name? The giant, uh, he was so in the audience. Yeah, Giant Silver was in that group. He just, man, Dr. Tom would work with that guy. He just couldn't get it in the ring. It's a shame because he had a look and he was so huge, but it just, it didn't translate to the ring. He couldn't get the, his, his body language, just couldn't get those bumps. Uh, the camps were fucking tough because they were bumping us for, God, I don't know how many hours a day. I mean, just it was real basic bumps, but just the fact you're getting slammed again again and again and again and you can't stand out and quit because if you want to sit on the sidelines fuck someone's going to take your spot so the camp was really good they, they bumped us around we had a show we worked for i forget who we worked for i worked gang Braille at one of the shows and cornet managed them and i forget how i worked a second night we just did that and you know the camp was cool because you weren't from dory's talking to dr tom who's fucking great and they explained things how they work in the company and, you know, they, they would look at you and they would videotape you and you need to work on this, you know, you need to work on that, okay, what direction you going here. So the camp was a good learning experience. It was fucking tough, too. Just all that bumping around day, you are like the tough enough kids, in some aspects, like, fuck, this this is brutal. Even though you know wrestling is brutal because you have, have experience at that point of bumping around, it's not like being the tough enough kids, but being bumped around for that many hours a day, man, I had a fucking headache. Who had the uh, most potential in that group? Beside yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, 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 I think they saw me as somebody, you know, if we get the cruiserweights going, you know, we could do something. Well, actually, who else was in that group? I think, what's his name? Uh, God. Big guy, uh, Nick Tierney, I think, was in that. Nick Tierney, I don't know if he does Ultimate Fighting or something now, but Nick Tierney was in there at the time. You know, uh, potential in, in, in the group. You know, they, they put my matches over and everything. You know, Vince would come around, and then he'd come around and watch the snare rack and having, having, you know, the boss watch and everything. Yeah, I, I, it's it's tough to say. It's, it's, who else was in that? Sean Stasiak was in that group, too. Sean was just fucking Sean. You know, if you ever met him, he's just, he's, he's a different variation of Vic. It's like, you tell the guy something and try to help him out, and he'd listen and just do the opposite. Like, Sean, whatever you do, don't run in the wall. Don't run in the wall. If you run in the wall, you're going to get hurt. What are you going to do? Well, I'm not going to run to the wall. Cool. Oh, <laughs> Sean, he ran on the wall. <laughs> oh, fuck. Stasiak, I thought, because he had such a good body on him, that's where they're going to use him and push him because of his dad and who it was. I thought, okay, he's going to do it. And interesting enough, who was there? Uh, Edge was up there. Edge hadn't started on TV yet. They put me in the ring with Edge just just to have a match with it. I was getting used more with different guys, which was flattering in some sense. They must have liked what I'm doing here and they would say stuff, but they don't want to put you over too much. Like, oh, you're doing so good. It's just like, and me, it's like, I don't, you know, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm pretty humble in aspects of I'm like, I'm not going to sit here and I can do this and can do that. I just, biggest, biggest aspect that I enjoy out of wrestling is for me is why I found, I think, what I've had up there for a while is, is I enjoy selling and putting something over. I could give two fucks less about me going out there and I got to get this shit in and I got to get that shit in and I got to get this. My mission, whether I'm going over or not, is is to put that guy in that angle over. Even if I'm going over, I want to get this guy over. You know, that's, that's how I look at wrestling. And I think that's why I had so much success early on up in WF because when I came in there, it's like, Bob, what do you want me to do? Bob's like this, and it's like, okay, it's cool with me. You know, as a tag team, as as, as the Hollies, uh, you know, I don't forget that. I'll still answer your question about the camps. Where were we on the camps? I was well, I was actually was going to ask you, were you guys supportive of each other, or was everyone out the backstab? Everyone was, out, everyone was very supportive of each other. No one was out the backstab because you don't know what's going on. You're just in the camps. Everyone's supportive. No one's trying to hurt anyone. Actually, who came up there, too? Rikishi came up there. For the, for the camp. Rikishi was in there and he was bumping around. He was cool as hell. Hmm. You know, he was, he was cool as hell. John Tenta was in the camp too. 
They have things come back to me. John Tent is in there. And here's John. He's a fucking veteran. He's already been up there. And he was a main guy a while ago. But John was going through stuff. He was cool as hell, too. we go out to eat afterwards. No one was a prick in the camp. Everybody was helpful to everybody. No, why was John Tent in the camp? John Tent was in the camp. It's before they threw him in the oddities. Okay. You know, they just didn't know what they were going to do with him. But they wanted him, I guess, to go through the camp to get his timing back or whatever. I don't know why. But John was fucking humble. He's like, I'll do it. You know, and here's someone who's a veteran right. who's been up there and been used, but he's in the camp with fucking guys who haven't been to the fucking to the dance. But John was cool as hell. You know, he's actually the coolest guy there. I think. What was Memphis like? Memphis, Memphis was, was was so cool because I was such a Memphis part. You know, and being wrestling in that studio right. and being there, it, it was so cool. And the show was run just like an old Memphis style thing. You know, and this is a case where you come in and they're gonna prepare you to work. Up in WF in the aspect of working TV is the main mission of being down there. Okay, you have a six minute match, go out there, put your six minute match together, you got the referee, the headset, tell you when to go home. That's the experience of working in Memphis. Uh, working out there is nerve wracking because you don't know when you're going to get called up. So you can't enjoy it as much as I could have if I knew what was going on. But this whole experience, I liked it, you know, going up there and working, it's nerve wracking, especially living with Vic Grimes is. <laughs> You know, fuck. There's a reason to become an alcoholic. Vic, <laughs> you know, but I mean, I look back; these these things are, are the experiences that helped me to learn more. You know, who were some of the top guys in Memphis that actually helped you? It was interesting. We came into Memphis. It it wasn't any. It was Randy Hills running it with Brandon Baxter. I think they're booking the shows. We all came down there, and it was me. It was Vic. It was. Actually, it was in the camp, too, was uh, A-Train was in the camp, you know. But he's brand new. He, he's green. He's, he just came out. I think where he graduated from, what's the guy? Is, uh, God, what's the guy uh, who was in Boston, his teacher, his school. I forget. Kowalski. The name. Kowalski. You know, A-Train came out of Kowalski's. So he's brand new up there. Uh, there's no one in really in Memphis. I mean, Jerry Hall was there. But Jerry Hall just came in and he worked TVs. You know, it wasn't the case. We didn't have, like, a lot of the things. We didn't have practice in Memphis. We didn't have anyone telling us what to do, this, that, and the other. Michael Hayes came down just to do a show for him, but it wasn't anyone like a lot of the guys later who got signed to developmentalists where they had practice. I think the thing about Memphis, but when they signed all of us, because I think we were pretty much a lot of the first developmental guys to get signed, they had a plan for each of us, I think, in their mind. Okay, we'll use this guy here. Vic could use to be here. Mick Tarrant could be here. Okay, we got an idea for Stasiak. We'll have an idea for this guy. So I don't think they, they learning from the experience of us is when they translated to have practices later on. We went down there, worked TV, worked a casino show, worked another show at like an armory. So, but it wasn't anyone in particular taking you by the hand and learning. It was just watching the TV and trying to learn from the guys you were there with. How much different was Memphis from wrestling in APW? <laughs> the ring was fucking, there was no padding in the ring. You know, I mean, this ring, it would bump, but it'd be like, I got hurt in the ring, actually. This was, is Memphis? Yeah, this is Memphis. I got hurt. I mean, I had my shoulder problem. I was wrestling Kid Wicked down there, and he gave me a suplex, and I landed right on my shoulder in, in a normal ring. I think it would have been all right, but this ring, it was Buddy Wayne's ring. You know, Buddy Wayne's ring. Hey, complain about the ring? What do you mean? Complain about the ring? Good ring? This ring was canvas with a thin piece of carpet and the wood. There was no padding in the ring, so, like, it would give. It had so much give to it. To where the guy would do a move, it would snap back up and hit you, Ooh. and it's like it'd be like in the cement. So like I hate bumping in the ring and doing stuff because it, it felt like shit, you know. Now I know why some of those Memphis guys used to bump like they did because the fucking ring would just be horrible. Initial thoughts of uh, when they proposed the wrestling idea of you wrestling as hardcore Holly's cousin. Here's how that came about. I'll, I'll talk about actually down in in Memphis. I got hurt. I thought I blew my shoulder out, but I just. I just hurt my shoulder. I had to keep it in a sling for two weeks. I went home to California. I came back. We're down there to show, and all of a sudden, Bruce Pritchard shows up, right? And everyone's like, oh, fuck, they're going to give me a good ring for somebody. So he comes in the room, and he's like, uh, Aaron, I'd like to talk to you outside. I'm like, oh, fuck. You know, what do I do? They're going to fucking release me. He says, well, he says, Aaron, we have an idea for you. He says, you know, we have a show, Super Ass Girls. I said, yeah. He says, you watch? I said, yeah, I watch. He says, well, we have this idea where... We'd like you to work on that show because they got a lot of smaller guys like you to work there. Maybe put you under a mask or, you know, something like that. We don't have anything really particular plan. We just we'd like you to work on that show. We'd like you to go to Mexico. Do you oppose going to Mexico? Of course, I'm not going to say no. You know, I've been to Mexico. I can't speak a word of Spanish. 
I lived down there for almost four months. I still can't speak Spanish. I said, no, I don't mind going down there. That's cool. So I left there. I went down there. I lived in Monterey, Mexico. All right. I got off the plane there, and man, who set that up? I think the guy for setting up stuff in, like, for Puerto Rico, Mexico, is Victor Quinones. Yeah, Victor. You know, Victor set the whole thing up. I went down there. I got there. I didn't know shit. I just know the hotel to go to. I get to this fucking hotel, and Mexico's fucking filthy. Man, God bless anyone who fucking works down there. I get there. I go over to the arena. It's in Mexico. These Fucking guys come out. They grab my bag. Say, come on. Right? They're pulling me out. I'm fucking nervous as hell. It's fucking dark. It's like one of the <laughs> shittiest places in the world. They take me to this hotel and bang on the door. Japanese guy opens up the door. It was Alexander Oscar. You know, right? He can't speak a word of fucking English. He can't speak Spanish. They throw me in the room with him and close the door. I'm sitting there like, what the fuck? What the fuck did I get into? <laughs> so I have my bed in that room and I'm sharing a room with him down there because they're they're paying for the room down there. So, okay, that's cool. Working in Mexico is is... Fuck, some of the guys were really cool. It was Antifaz, his mother, right. and the promotion. Right. right, Antifaz is fucking great. You know, the ring down there right, in Monterey. Oh. <coughs> I know Antifaz. Antifaz love books. We got him booked in ECW. Yeah, Antifaz yeah. is great, man. He is cool. His mother passed away. When? Oh, really? Yeah, who told that. me, uh, Tajiri told me his mother passed away maybe about a month ago. Oh, wow. Some two months ago, probably. All right, we're talking about uh, Mexico. Yeah, so I think I get down there. I'm, I'm, I'm in the room with Alexander. He don't speak a word of English. So I'm like, what the fuck did I get myself into? You know, I want to make it to the company so bad. You, you just you do anything they ask, you know? And Super Astros is a step to get on TV. So fuck yeah, I'm going to do it, you know? So I'm down there. I think, uh, I think the first person who came by was Tarzan Boy. Tarzan Boy speak English. He was cool as hell. He said, you need anything? Talk to me, you know? Let me show you around. Tarzan was cool as hell. Went there, I met, went down to the gym. They had this gym down there, and it's down there. I'm in summertime, and Monterey, Mexico, it's probably like 110 degrees, and it's fucking humid, and man, it's it's just brutal outside, maybe 115. We go to the gym, and this gym is just, fuck, man. It is the worst looking, fucking most Neanderthal gym in the world, but the guys are working out. It's the only place to work out there. Meet Antipas, he's cool as hell. He takes us up, we meet his mom, Okay, we're cool. Everything's cool. And, you know, she's trying to explain to us we're going to start working, you know, this week and everything. It's like, okay. So Antifas explained to us they're going to give us both masks. We're going to wrestle under masks. In fact, I've never done this. Okay, this is cool, right? But the show there, the, the Coliseum in, in Monterey, there's no air conditioning, obviously. And the windows are open. And the show starts, I think, at probably 530 at night. And they gave me the name of Green Ghost. And if you say Green Ghost fast enough, what does it sound like? Go ahead. Gringo. Right, green. Yeah, Gringo. Yeah. One of the fucking luchadors down there tried to tell me Green Ghost in Spanish means Phantasma Warrior. But I think it's a fucking rib on me. <laughs> you know? I like to get those tapes. I don't know where those tapes are because they had the television show there from Monterey. I just like to have those. I don't know where the hell those things are. But just working down there, most of the luchadors are cool, you know? But I got down there the first week. I'm in, you know, like the second match or something like that, you know? By the time the third week rolls around, maybe it was even the second week, they got me in the main events. Fuck, I don't even speak Spanish, let alone I've never done lucha. They were sending us to go train to lucha class, which was cool as hell, but it was outdoors, and it was at the fucking gym, and you're just dying. I probably almost had a heart attack a couple huh. times because you're out in the sun, in this weather, doing lucha, running high spots. Fuck, I must have lost, I don't know how much weight down there, and I almost had so many heart attacks. All the lucha doors, most of them were pretty cool. Was it Preta Morgan? Was Fucking great. Antifaz is cool. There's one motherfucker, Pimpinella. Huh. Pimpinella, if that motherfucker ever comes to the United States, I'll beat the fuck out of him. You know, <laughs> this is the only guy. I've never I've never had a problem with when most people get to know me, they like me. I'm pretty likable because it's just my personality. I had to work Pimpinella down there. I was doing six mans and eight mans all the time, which was cool because, okay, we're, we're putting together a match and you don't have to speak wrestling as a universal language. Even Lucha, you don't need to know how to speak language. You can talk with your body, okay, this, that. Cool, and you can talk about certain things. They started doing singles matches with Pimpinella, and the fuckers just beating on me in the ring. No fucking rhyme, no reason. I don't know why. The only reason I could figure out is that we're wrestling semi main, and I don't, I don't need to know Spanish to know that some of the luchador are talking shit about me because here I am, the American. I'm coming in. I'm taking somebody's spot because I'm white and I'm American, and you're going to use that guy. Also, they're going to use me because my office sends me down there. 
So I can see the point of some of the guys getting pissed and talking shit, but it's a business on the other facts. But I don't want to fucking be there. Man, I want, I want to be in the main event. Put me in the fucking preliminary. Let me learn lucha because I don't know fucking what I'm doing. That motherfucking Pimpinella would stiff me again and again and again. My fear is at first retaliation because I'm in a foreign country. I don't know who Pimpinella knows. I'm trying to think with my head on one point. But another point, I'm getting so fucking pissed in the ring that this guy just keeps coming. And he keeps coming. We had a match in Laredo, Texas, and he kept coming in the match and coming and coming, and I've never been one to retaliate in the ring. It takes a lot for me to get fired up. I just think it's unprofessional. I think if you want to fight somebody, wait till they get to the back, because to me, when you do something in the ring, when you take it to that level, it's unprofessional, and you can die in the ring. You know, people have, people have fucking died. People have gotten paralyzed because you're giving your body up to someone. I'm giving my body to this motherfucker, and he's just completely disrespecting me. So there's one point where he's going to jump up, and I'm going to catch him for a power bomb, which he called. The rings down there are like, this This is softer here. This this fucking thing's softer than the rings down there. I power bombed that motherfucker so hard, as hard as I could, and he almost didn't get up, and he was spitting blood. But the next time I had to wrestle him, they are building for a match. It was a hair versus mask match. You know? I don't even know what the fuck's going on. Like, you had... Shocker's down there. I think he speaks English. He was cool as hell. Shocker's trying to explain to me things and stuff. And I got the translators trying to put the match together with Pimpinella. I'm like, whatever you want to do. They're building a match where the crowd's going to decide if I lose my mask or he gets his fucking hair loss. You know? So I'm we're doing the match and he's fucking pounding me. We go outside and we're wrestling in a bullfighting arena. He's throwing Coke bottles at me. You know, just no rhyme, no reason. I'm like, get this fucking match over with. We get the match over with. Or thing. I don't know how it works out. Matches down there where it's like uh, there's three rounds. God, I've I blanked out so much memory about that because it was such a bad experience. We get the match over with and the crowd's deciding and I'm like this, just ready to rip that fucking mask off. I don't care whether he has to cut his hair or not. I don't want to wrestle in the mask because I don't want to rip this motherfucker and do anything. I think there had to be like a return match or some shit like that. I don't know what it was. But even before they announced it, I was a loser. I ripped my mask off and I fucking threw it at him. You know, and I went in the back. You know, and I, funny enough is I wanted the mask because it was like my my ring gear, my shit, certain things I don't part with because they mean something to me. You know, I went there with the mask. I wanted that. I asked him, can I please have the mask? Like, no, no, no. And he was a real dick. And in fact, if I ever see that's one motherfucker, if I ever see him, I'll fucking get him. You know, because that's just no respect for me and my body time and time and time again. Actually, I got, I was down there and Bruce, I called Bruce Pritchard to tell him the problem I was having. I said, you know what, I, I just... I have a problem down there working just one guy and just some of the guys, I feel like I'm being threatened down here and I'm in a foreign country. I don't feel safe. I don't know who I got to work next. You know, Bruce heard that. He says, okay, let me get back to you. So then I, he says, okay, we're going to have you come home. I went home. I went to, uh, I went to TV. Let me think the town I was in. I wrestled with Kurt Angle in the dark match. This is when Kurt Angle was still doing dark matches. Actually, Kurt Angle came in Memphis and started down there as I was leaving, you know, as I was thinking I was leaving to go out of it. So Kurt stayed there. Bruce says, we're going to have you come TV this week, and, you know, we're going to, we might have something in mind for you. I didn't know what they had in mind. Would this be Milwaukee? This is this wouldn't be Milwaukee. This would be before Milwaukee. Okay. I forget where it was, but this this is the idea. I wrestled the match with Kurt. They just wanted to see what I looked like because I hadn't been up there a while. The match with Kurt was good. I was happy. Kurt was happy. And the office was happy. So Bruce says, okay. They call me up. I think he called the phone. He says, we have this idea where I want to make you Hardcore Holly's cousin. So I don't know if you know what's going on with Bob. I said, yeah, I know Bob. He thinks he's a super heavyweight. He goes, that's what we want to do. He goes, we want to make you Bob's cousin, and you think you're a super heavyweight. Just dye your hair blonde, and we got the seamstress to make you the tights. That's all they told me. That's the only thing they got. I never got any rhyme or reason or direction as far as for anything else they wanted. So everything as far as for being crash, and that was my idea of how to act and how to interact or what I should do to help get Bob over, you know, because this was something. The thing about Bob Holly is they didn't tell Bob. They didn't ask Bob, do you want a cousin? They just said, you're getting a fucking cut. And Bob's like, what? And I see Bob's point. Bob, when I first met Bob, Bob didn't like me. You know, Bob's fucking straight ahead. You don't fuck around. He'll tell you what's on his mind. And I respect Bob for that. I felt bad in some ways because Bob was starting to get over with the super heavyweight thing and he was finally starting to get some spots and work with some of the some of the guys he hadn't with. So I was like, oh, fuck, you know, I could see where 
man, I'm going to get the fuck beat out of me. I could tell, but I'll take it. That's cool with me, you know? It just, uh, starting off with that and, and working with that, I think that's the, the case of working with Bob is is everything leading up to that. If I didn't have the experience that I did as far as for how many of knowing what to do, I don't think it would have worked because uh, I think just, I was just say, was, um, that the character of starting off with Crash Hall, you, you're not supposed to be an offensive character. You're supposed to be get the fuck beat out of you. You know, right. that's how a story is off. That's the angle where they're going with where it's fighting cousins and you just fight amongst each other, you know. Did he help you all inside or outside? Bob was fucking great. Bob, I learned a lot from Bob. Bob would listen and Bob would shoot shit straight to you. He wouldn't fuck around. It's, he wouldn't sugarcoat stuff, you know. He would shoot it out to you straight whether you liked it or not. I earned a lot of Bob's respect because I just took the beatings and I wouldn't have it anywhere. Then I'd go back and do it the same way. I love Bob Ali. He's, he's great. If it wasn't for Bob Holly and the idea they have, I think the original idea for Crash was Vince Russo. Because I was coming up there when Russo was going out. The original idea for the name and the concept was Russo, which the funny idea is when I come out in Milwaukee, I mean, here I am, the only promo I've ever done. I did like one in APW, you know? Then I did the one Memphis Power, Memphis, uh, Power Pro promo, which got cut off by Kid Wicked. It wasn't even a promo. I said like five words. We get up there to Milwaukee. I got my hair dyed. They give me my tights. Someone comes and gives me my lines what to say, and I got a promo. I, well, what the fuck is this? You know, they don't give you, and then they give me no direction of how to talk or how to do anything. I don't know why they, that, that company up there, it's, it's sink or swim in a lot of aspects. Let's see what you can do. And, and that was a concept that's kind of like the trial, like, you can do it, they're going to go on with it. But somebody obviously must have liked me because I wouldn't have gotten that spot if they did. Right, right. What are your memories of working your first pay-per-view at SummerSlam 99? Hey, everything happened so fast. You know, it's just, it, it's it's hard to put into words unless you actually experience it of working up there, especially when the business was hot. I mean, here we are. The business is so hot where you got 15, between 15 and 18,000 people, some of these shows, you know, and just, it all happened so so fast to where it doesn't seem real because you work so many years to get somewhere and then you get thrown with somebody and a gimmick of being a super heavyweight and, and what they're doing it's just like it doesn't seem real at the time because especially coming from mexico working in a fucking shithole where and you know you got cockroaches everywhere and rodents i try to go running and do cardio on the streets tonight fuck man you got it just filthy down there and you don't know whether you're going to get jumped or mugged and you just got to watch out going from that element there to going up to a company and and so much was there and things just clicking right away it's hard to explain it doesn't seem real you know going out there and working it i think uh i think the first night in milwaukee they never showed it on tv because it's when they taped raw one they're, they're still taping raw we actually did that stuff there but then in the end we ran down me and bob and, and i think the undertaker both ladies out which they never showed so just being involved with a lot of those guys and then just doing the promo like i did uh, on the big show and the undertaker it doesn't seem real because you never think you're going to get to that point at least a lot of the guys you hope you can get to that company you think you have the talent you want to show what you can do you bust your ass for a number of years and learn from your experiences but when it actually happens it doesn't seem real because am i really here is it really going on so it's it, it's like it's kind of like a dream or it just doesn't seem real Whose idea was it for you to carry the skeleton ring? And of course, Ed Ferrara, or somebody comes up to us, you know, if we were in California at the time, and someone says, we have this idea since you're super heavyweights, want you to go out there, I want you to, you know, carry the scale of the ring. And Bob's like, fucking scale, you know? And me, I start thinking, because I like, I like sarcastic comedy. It was a perfect fit for me, the, the being with Bob. I, I didn't know it could be good. You know, I'm like, man, that's fucking, that, that's so fucking, some of the ideas, up there that you wouldn't think will work, or some people at least wouldn't think work, will get over so big. You know, kind of like Moppy. You know, Moppy's so huh. fucking off the wall, you know? And and Perry is someone who's so serious, and he goes out there and does this, but they give Perry this fucking gimmick, and it's so off the wall, but the people are fucking eating it up. You know, fucking Moppy is so ridiculous. Think about the scale is so ridiculous. Here's Bob, and here's this fucking guy. You know, here's this fucking midget. I've called myself a midget, you know? Here's this guy carrying a scale and they're gonna weigh people for it. It's so it's it's so sarcastic. Comedy, my thing about wrestling is comedy will always work. If it's done the right way by the right people at the right time, comedy can work. And carrying the scale to the ring, it just it just fucking worked with us. What did you think of the gimmick? I mean, you liked it, obviously. I, I love the thing with Bob. I was really Bob got hurt 
and that's why I wasn't with Bob. I just I wish I would have got to tag along with Bob. I mean, we we started we started to get over not for our tag matches because we didn't have a finish. We didn't have any tag team moves. You know, Bob liked to do his thing. It's like I just sat there and like whatever you want to do, Bob. You're cool. Bob's a veteran. He's the leader. Even though I've been doing a number of years, Bob, it's your deal. Whatever you think, and even the guys working you, it's whatever you think. Whatever you want to do, you know what you think goes best. You know. I wish I would have got to tag along with Bob because I thought we got so many pre-tapes in the back. We had such good chemistry, me and him. He's a straight guy. I'm the fucking idiot. And actually, the inspiration for the promo in the beginning, because I didn't know. I thought, fuck, how do I do a promo? How should I act? Because this is a big test. Here I am, Milwaukee, and there's going to be so many fucking people here. How do I act out there? I knew my particular lines, which you don't have to say verbatim, but I knew I had to get certain points across. There's a guy named Joe Applebomber, worked in California. Joe's got that real... Yeah, yeah, kid. What do you want to do? Yeah. So I thought if I take a little bit of Joe and a little bit of myself and have that kind of, yeah, right. you know, that little bit of personality, because I can do that, because a little bit of that's in me, that's where I got the idea for that. Memories of winning tag titles from uh, Cactus and uh, Mankind. I, I just, I mean, and The Rock. I, it just happened. Things up there happened so fast. And Bob told me too. When I got up there, and we started doing good the first couple weeks, and fucking Ed Farrar, they're putting it over, saying, fucking holidays are going to be so over. I don't see it because You're in it. I'm in it, and I don't fucking see this shit working. It's like I, trying to hear the crowds and do stuff and, and just hearing people saying, this shit's working. It's like, I can't tell it's working. You know, Bob told me, he says, if this works with us, they're going to give us a run, and, you know, we'll get the fucking straps and they'll push us like that. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm a fucking bitch. You know, there's no way they're giving that. That's you watch WF as a kid and you see all these guys. You never think you're going to actually get up there. When I'm signed, when when Bruce Pritchard tells me I'm going to do Super Astros, that's as far as I'm going to get in the company because this is a big man's company. You know, that's how I perceive the company is. I never think I'm going to get up there. But through the gimmick, you tell people you're 400 pounds. It's believable that I can get up there and do things. Working with those guys is like it doesn't even seem real being out there and working certain guys. You can hear the crowds. When you go out there and you're working against Rocky, that's a different fucking ball game here in that crowd. It's just like the reception that guy gets out is the match itself was was sloppy. You know, the match itself was that particular but the angle and the storyline writing of, of of things where where mankind's not getting along with Rocky, so he's gonna turn his back and sit there out with him. So Rocky's out there, so obviously the psychology is here's these two guys who can't even get along. But since it's two on one, if they work hard enough, they can cooperate long enough because his partner's sitting on the outside and that's how the hobbies fucking win. Right, right. You know, which is good. It was good shit. It was well written. Memories of your matches against the Hardys. Matt Matt and Jeff, I felt more more comfortable talking to Matt and Jeff because they're younger than me, but just like certain guys you click or talk more and you feel more comfortable with working with Matt and Jeff and seeing how, you know, we did that thing and fucking and I think it's it's I always think it's the little things or certain points that they get guys over people remember. And I still get talked about today when Bob cut the promo and he called Gangrel a fat bastard, called him Dracula, and he told Jeff Hardy, you know, get on the scale anorexic Andy. And just being sarcastic and doing that starting stuff with, with them was great. They were absolutely great. They were you were you go up there, I mean you're working with the acolytes, Bradshaw and Ron, it's like, man, when Ron wants to get you to one side of the ring or another, he's gonna fucking get you. He's gonna move and Man, it's just working with those guys. You know, Ron's been around forever. He's a fucking veteran. You, I feel more comfortable with, with Matt and Jeff Smith because they're younger. Not that I'm, how should I say this? It's more intimidating to work with the acolytes because they'll fucking beat the fuck out of you. You know, clear as day. You want to fight them? Cool. What they going to do? Beat the fuck out of you. I'll just take the beating. Working with Matt and Jeff, they're younger, and I feel it was easier to bounce ideas and doing stuff off that. Plus they're starting to come into their own and doing stuff to where they're with gang rail. Okay. They're not. And it was, it was, man, it was really exciting. Just like I said, everything's happening so fast and click and everything they're using with this is click. And it just doesn't seem real. What about your matches with uh, Edge and Christian? Match with Edge and Christian, like I said, it, it, it's, it's, those guys are, those guys are cool too. Cause they're younger. They're more your age and, and they're up and coming. They're always receptive to doing ideas, but my idea is working tag matches with, like I said, the Hollies is a tag team. We didn't, we didn't get over for our in the ring work. We got over more or less. I mean, Bob has good shit in the ring. I'll do shit where I'm Bob. I'll sell. That's cool with me. I don't have, I'm not have fucking any offensive moves. I don't, I'm not an offensive minded wrestler. I like them like Tommy. I like to sell. Do DDT. I don't do DDT, but I like to sell. 
working with those guys is cool. It's like my attitude. Who my attitude? Whoever I work with, I want to get them over. It and what do they do? And how can I work their style? I think that's why I had a good run up there because someone told me when we were in APW, someone told me about Jushin Liger. They said Jushin Liger. I don't know if this is true or not. Jushin Liger doesn't do the same thing every night because. He likes to keep the crowd guessing, and also Justin Liger likes to do different stuff. I kind of took that attitude as an aspect of like a baseball player. If you have a baseball player who can do a bunch of different stuff, different, if he could bat from both sides of the plate, and he could do a lot of different things, he's more valuable to a company than somebody who just does one thing. I've never been that type of wrestler who says, I gotta get my shit in ABC. That's not my style. I have the wrestler like, okay, I'm wrestling this big guy. I have to wrestle a certain way and try to get him over that way. I'm wrestling the Hardys. They like to do this shit. I'm cool. What do you want to do? Wrestling Asian Christian. They like to do that. I'll just be a chameleon and do stuff, you right. know, whatever they want. It was, it was, yeah, working with those guys, it was it was a good experience. Were you surprised when they took the, I guess, the tag photos off you guys after two weeks? Or? Bob, Bob was fucking hot, you know, because he thought, he thought, they told Bob, if it works, we're going to give you the straps and push with the strap because obviously, it, it helps get you over when you put in that position, you know? And I think Bob was disappointed because it was working with me and him. Why, why are you fucking taking it away? You know, that's what Bob's attitude. Me, I was like, I didn't understand, but like, this is farther I thought than I would get in my career. So I was still happy. It didn't matter to me. I was like, you know, okay. Thoughts of the skits, I guess. Oh no, the hardcore totals. Were you uh, for them or against them? Here, here's, I never know, like, I never know who came up with, you know, I, I was really, as far as for my my run there and I had there, there's nothing left to do there that I, I thought I did more than I ever thought I would. You know, I don't know who wrote most of that stuff for me in the beginning. I know Vin, I think I think Vince Russo came up with my name. I came up with the way I acted or did stuff, and I didn't point as far as for being a fucking sarcastic idiot or doing that stuff. One of the writers, I can't think of his name. He's not there anymore. Writer comes up, he says, "I got this idea. We want to put the hardcore belt on." We want to do a thing where the rule is it's defended 24-7. You know, we just have ideas. You can depend on here, depend on there. It's a lot of pre-taped stuff. And as you know, pre-taped pre stuff gets you over. You want to do it? I said, oh, fuck yeah. I thought it could be good because it could be sarcastic stuff. It's something that was never done before. You know, I wrestled Test. And let me think where it was. I think Bob was hurt at the time. Now, Bob, if you're coming back for an injury, I don't know if he's hurt. But uh, I wrestled Test in Nashville was when I won the belt off him. And they didn't do it till two weeks later. Or maybe I did the promo there. They just gave me the basis of it where you have to tell people the belt's in line 24-7, seven days a week, and go from there. I never politicked for any idea for that. The writers came up with it. Probably Bruce Pritchard came up with a lot of it too. They could have done so many more different directions, but the shit they did was, I thought it was so entertaining. The thing about that, that I like about the 24-7 is it's the, it was something, I like the little things that might not mean nothing else, but mean the world to me. Something, it's so hard in wrestling to get something over that's different. You know, you've seen a million moves. I don't think you can go any higher or take any more risks than some of the moves the guys do, especially in the independents or in your thing, Ring of Honor. Some of these guys are just fucking incredible athletes doing the shit they do. But doing something like the 24 7 where a title's defended 24 days, you know, on the line, and the skits they have and the pre tape shit, you know, is something so different. And the aspect is, I'm helping get a belt over in an angle that's never been done before, but I'm also helping all these people get over because they're getting over because they're beating the fuck out of me, but I'm getting over because I'm using the one theory that works for a baby face, and the one theory how a baby face will always get over and how he has to get over is he has to sell. If you can't sell good as a baby face, then you're not going to be able to get over as a baby face. You have to have the people want you to come back and beat the fuck out of that guy. You have to have the people believe in you. You have to have the people believe that you're hurt and that you're selling. That, that's the one aspect I like. That's my favorite aspect I like about the business is the people that sell. That's the thing that hooked me about Japan is, man, these motherfuckers, I can't tell if they're hurt or not. Right. I don't know if these guys are hurt. Are they really hurt? You know, like a match that stuck out. It's uh, Buddy Rogers and what's his name in Chicago, uh, Comiskey Park. I don't know. It's Buddy Rogers and who? Uh, was it Gene oh, something? Gene Gene yeah, Gene yeah, that match or, there. Or Pat O'Connor. Yeah, Pat O'Connor. That's it. That match there. I think it was two out of three falls. Was yeah. it? Yeah. The selling that Buddy Rogers is doing the match. You don't know if he's hurt or not. Right, right. It looks so fucking believable, you know. And even though even though Buddy's a heel, this applies to a babyface. You need selling. 
today's wrestling, it's like you need to sell. And that's what worked about 24-7. It's a believable constant. The guy was selling. Everybody gets over. Right. The belt, me, all the people beating the fuck out of me. It's, it was a concept that was done. I'm really proud of that. I'm proud that I got selected to do that. It just happened. It's right place, right time. Somebody liked me to write that shit. Somebody came up with it because I didn't come up with any of those ideas. I just uh, Actually, the thing I only came up with was running away because I don't have a finish. I don't have a catchphrase. I don't have a finish. I just hit the guy and run away. So that's where that whole thing started. What was your favorite skit that you did with that? Uh, the one where we did um, with the headbangers at um, the, the video games and uh, yeah, what was it? It was like a kid's play place. It was three levels. We did one pr one take on it. You know, it was with the headbangers and I did a, I get, people give a compliment on the hurricanrana off the thing. I grabbed the rope and I did it to, I think Mosh. Right. And the amazing part is like most pre-tapes on anything, guys fuck up. Okay, we got to do it again. Sometimes shit takes five, six, seven, a long time. That was one take. We did it. Man, they, they beat they beat the fuck. I mean, a couple of things. They whipped me with the belt, but I mean, it came off good. But something like that, it's so goofy that it hasn't been done. It's comedy and right. it works. It's different than everyone else. I can't, me as a wrestler, I can't convince you I'm more intense than Benoit or Team Angle, but I can be comedy, I can be sarcastic, and I can sell. That's why it works. I just like the whole concept. It was something that wasn't done before. Looking back, do you think that the 24 7 rule and the numerous title changes back and forth made the title seem less important in the fans' eyes, or do you think it's. It, it's a matter. It's like titles are. The wrestling business changes throughout the decades. You know, titles today aren't. Let me think. To me, at least, when I look at the titles today, they don't have the importance that they once did. And obviously, if you go back to the NWA days where there were territories and the champion would visit the territories, or if you go back to the WF, we have Honky Tonk Man, where you got the belt so long and means some. Right. You know, you have the things where they're not doing title changes. I think today, you know, they do too many title changes where it seems like it lose meaning. To me, at least. Think about the 24-7. I don't think it, it disgraced the belt because... You're doing a gimmick that, that that's necessary for the title to change. That's a comedy aspect of it. Anyone can fucking win the thing, and everyone's just beating the fuck out of each other. You know, I don't think it disgraced the belt because prior to that, what were they doing with that belt? You know, guys were having hardcore matches and beating the fuck out of each other. But a belt, to me at least, it's an honor to be put, put in, it's an honor to be put in the position of getting the belt. You know, I always have a thing where people are like, I won the belt, I won this. No, you didn't, dude. They gave you the belt. You came to the meeting. You came to the fucking show today, and they said you're going over, and you went over. What did you do with that belt? Did you get somebody over? Were you involved in a good program? How did it evolve? That's the thing about losing and the title change. I don't think it disgraced it because I think I get still get compliments today. And in the year 2000, to me at least, that was an important part of that show. You know, if you look at the programming there, you obviously got your main guys, but you need pieces in the puzzle. 24-7 was a piece in the puzzle in the year 2000, and I'm proud of that. What are your memories of uh, the Battle Royal of WrestleMania 2000? Oh, God. With Battle Royal, the finish didn't go right. You know, it was supposed to be, it was supposed to be me, Taz, and Bob. And it's a tough finish because Timmy White's got the thing in his ear, and the actual finish is supposed to be Taz hooks me in, Taz mission. Bob comes in and hits him with the glass thing. Bob covers me, one, two, time goes out, right? What actually happened was Timmy, I don't know, Timmy felt so bad too, Timmy White, it's like he's listening in the earpiece and he's watching the clock because he thinks two different things. So I was actually supposed to go over that to me. It wouldn't matter to me whether I go over or not. It's a matter of is everybody getting over it not. I got to the building in Anaheim and they wouldn't let me in because I didn't have my fucking parking pass. And to me, it's like they're real, some buildings are like that. So just I'm in the building in the middle of the day and to me, it's like, it's, it's, I think Tommy, Tommy Dreamer said this best, you know, they can, in the wrestling business, they can't take away your accomplishments and they can't take away your talent and ability. You know, the simple fact that they built a match around WrestleMania after all the hard work that all the guys did and I did too was an absolute honor to me to contribute to something like that to the history of, of the business, you know, just sitting there. In the daytime. And actually, I didn't know until that day of WrestleMania if I was going over or not. You know, they don't tell you. They tell you what you need to know on most bases there. I didn't know what was going over. I got there at the building. I got there in the day, and there was Jerry Briscoe, and he called me over. He called Bob and called Taz over, and he told us what they wanted for the finish. So like, okay. And then we worked with the rest of the guys, and we were going to do it. Bob hit me with a plastic fan, and I got that scar right at the top of my head and just busted me open. And Pete Gas got it worse than I did, which is I was bleeding all over the place, which is good because... 
the thing about those matches is I like the concept of, of WWF or even WWE today because they don't bleed as much. Back in the day, I remember going to watch NWA and going to watch, uh, what is that show? Two Rings with the Cage. What is that? War, War Games. I used to go watch War Games in San Francisco. Everybody was fucking getting color, you know? Yeah, they got away from color. They do themes now. They'll do color, and it will mean something a lot of times, you know? I think it was good. Even though it was hard ways, there was guys getting color in the match because prior to all that, all the hardcore matches, no one's getting color. You know, should should they get color in matches? Yeah, fuck, they should because you're getting hit with shit. But it just worked out. It meant more on the biggest show because you got two guys fucking bleeding up a storm. No one knows if it's fucking an axe or not. It meant more for the match. Um, did WWE ever hold you back from doing moves or wrestling in fast style? No, I never. I never. I used to wrestle a different style, and then when I got there, it's like you know, a lot of times fans will you you, you read the internet and guys like. You know, especially a program like Monday Night Raw. You know, if I know if I go to Monday Night Raw, let's say I'm wrestling Stevie Richards. First, I'll beat the fuck out of because of Stevie. So if I'm wrestling Stevie and I have, they say we have six, you have six minutes. Stevie goes over. Okay, I got to get there together with Stevie and, and and watch. By the time you get up to the gorilla, maybe you got four minutes, and then maybe you get down to the ring, you got three. You have to know what to cut out. It irritates me sometimes when fans are like, "Well, the match sucks." The guys is I can watch the show now and I can tell when the guys are being rushed and they're cut on time. You know, uh, I think, what was your question again? I was kind of rambling. If they ever told you to change your style. No, I, never, I changed my style because it's not about, to me, it's not It's not about doing certain moves to get over. It's about what it takes to get the angle or the issue in person over. You know, I did, a lot of the moves I used to do, I don't do anymore. I do more low risk stuff now, but it still works. I used to, and I used to I watch up there. I get up there and I think, man, look at the main guys up here. Are the main guys going off the top rope here? No, they don't. Okay, here's the main event guys. And if you look at the history of the business, the main event guys don't go off the top rope. They don't have to risk themselves. If I'm doing this stuff with Bob or 24-7 and I don't have to do these risky moves to get over, if that, to me, it didn't seem like I had to do more of the stuff I used to because it wasn't going to make a difference, to me at least. So they never told me to change my style. I changed my style because I thought that's what necessary to get the guys over or to get over what I'm working with. So, no, they never told me any of that. Memories of uh, King of the Ring tournament, 2000. Uh, King of the Ring tournament. I, I uh, once again, I didn't, you know, I didn't know. They just told me going into that that you're going to be the underdog. Okay, mm -hmm. I think prior to the week they might have told me I was going over on Bull Buchanan, but I went over on Bull. I, I liked the match. I've only worked with Kurt on TV twice. I like both the matches I had with him. I worked the Sunday Night Heat match. I was going to ask you about him. that. Next. Oh, okay, yeah. the kind of thing with working with Kurt is working so late in the car, but it's like. We didn't talk about a lot of stuff in the match, but I watched the match now. I watched it a couple months ago. It seemed like we did a lot. You know, I thought my timing was good. It's just, and then just coming out there again. I mean, I don't know where they came up with the hardcore eating gown match. That was on Wrestle Crap, by the way. One of my favorite websites, Wrestle Crap. And if, everybody, if I'm ever in a bad mood, I go to Wrestle Crap. And man, that guy who writes that shit and puts it on, it's just, if it's so bad, it's good and it's on there. So the hardcore eating matches, gown eating matches on there. Being a part of that and being stuck in so many spots is just, Man, that's that's one of my favorite pay per views. What was it like wrestling Davy Boy Smith over in England on pay per view? How much he like to work with? Davy Boy's cool. He he was receptive to stuff. You, you work at a legend, you know. It's whatever he wants to do, and it's 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 a little nerve wracking. He was safe as hell. It was cool. You know, it's, it's obviously it's, it's an honor to work with somebody like that. Get to work certain guys. Uh, it was cool, you know. Then he he beat me over there. Then I got to go over on him. He was cool with everything. Not a problem. What was he like outside the ring? I didn't know him outside the ring. I just know him through talking to him. He was pretty quiet, you know. They gave you a Molly Holly then. They, what, what did you think of that game? They came up to me. I don't know if Bob was hurt. Bob's just had a bad luck when he's gotten hurt. They said we have an idea. Want to give you a want to give you a cousin, Molly Holly. You know, it's going to be this girl. Okay, and I didn't watch. I watched WCW a little bit, but I didn't know her work. You know, and people were saying she's a good worker. She's a really good worker. She was receptive to the stuff. I had ideas. I said, well, I go, what do you want to do? And we bounced ideas like how she should act and what she should do. I thought it was good. You know, I thought it was something good because they came to me and thought to put her with me because I could help her or she could help me get something over. You know, I was very receptive to it because anytime they keep throwing you shit, it means something. Somebody likes you. I can't turn shit down. I'm not going to turn shit down. I'll fucking do it. It's cool. Memories were, uh, I guess you worked a program with Test, Albert, and Trish. 
We worked that we worked that program, and every time test, he never once fucking kicked me in the face on the finish. It always looks like he did though, because I'd be so like, "Fuck, what's that thing again?" Okay, but you gotta, man, you gotta bomb for the test to take your fucking head off with that foot. That was cool working with those guys, but man, it seemed like we worked fucking every SmackDown for like a fucking month and a half with those guys. It was like, and working those guys is hard because you gotta work the bigger guys. I think that's the only time I ever did the flip in Frankensteiner off test, you know, because I trust that move there. It's like. The guy's got to be bigger because it will knock you back. I did it to Modest a few times. Modest caught me good, but it's like I did it to other guys where they've caught me and I've fallen back and I've almost broken my neck. So I got to work this. I got to do that move. And people, it's a funny thing. I think uh, Charlie Hosh came up to me uh, before I uh, uh, was out of the company. He said, man, I see you do that move with Test. He goes, why don't you do more shit like that? And my theory is if I got over by not doing it, why do I need to do it? You know, maybe it's just me working smarter or doing a number of years. And I think guys do change their styles. Even Matt Hardy, you look some of Matt Hardy's older stuff where he's doing some shit. He don't do it anymore because he's a smarter worker because you don't have to do that stuff. A lot of people look at it sometimes, well, you're selling out. You're not doing this. No, you're working smart. And, you know, to me, if you you can't you can't keep up that style for years upon end because your body breaks down. And plus, the more high risk stuff you do and the more stuff you put out there, the bigger chance you're going to get hurt. I can go in. I can go in with with. God, the simplest wrestler in the world. I can go in with Bill Dundee and I can get hurt. And Bill has such a simple match. He's not going to hurt you. But I just think of a lot of, if you're doing something and it's working and the people in the back are happy and you're happy with what you're doing, why do you have to change anything? If it's working, do it. If the fans start shitting on you and chanting boring, maybe I got to try something else. Speaking of uh, the Hardys, Jeff Hardy, did you see um, the change in style with him and all the problems? That you did the I, I, I know Jeff. I used to hang out with Jeff, you know. Uh, I seen I seen a change from the stuff that Jeff used to do to where I don't know all the details of one thing. I just think he was burnt out. That's just my opinion. Jeff, I think his his uh, his ring style showed that he didn't want to be there. You know, that's to me to me that it showed because Jeff Jeff's shit was so on and crisp. So before where he's going with Matt and they're building up to where. You know, just talking and hearing stuff. And I don't like to fucking get involved in guys' business. I just hear stuff, okay, Jeff's burned out. Jeff don't want to do it. You know, Jeff shows up late to the building. He's doing stuff. If Jeff don't care, does it show in the ring? Yeah, his ring work changed. You know, it changed. Why? I don't know. I'm not in his shoes. Uh, I never saw a change in attitude towards me. I love Jeff to death. They go with him great. Fuck, he goes to North Carolina. and it can beat my ass if I don't say something good about him. No, Jeff's, Jeff's great. You know, I just, it's, there's so much, maybe my opinion is, that his body needed a break, maybe his mind too, because when you're up in that company, it'll take a toll sometimes more on your mind than your body, right. to me at least. And maybe he was just so burnt out because he just wanted to get a break. I don't think, he's still young. I think he'll come back. I think he'll work there. That's my opinion, because he still has a lot to offer, but just, I see the change in his ring style. Memories of you winning the uh, European title and then losing it, I guess, two years later. European title? I, uh, it was over there. It was cool. I got to work with Regal. Uh, they, they put the match over. I was really happy with the match. It was such a simple match to me. But sometimes the most simple shit works, you know? Uh, it's it just, I, I've been really lucky and fortunate to, to be in the spots that I have. And, and like I said, some guys in this business, they have certain agendas. Like they want to accomplish certain things. It was never my mission to accomplish. I'd like to win. Like some of the guys, they even talk today, I'd like to win the world title belt. That's cool if they want to do that. It's never my mission to win any belts. To me, because I never thought, I never even put myself in that mind frame of I'm going to win a belt because I just thought of a certain level I'd like to get to. And when it went way beyond, then it's just like, it's more than I ever expected. Working with Regal, he was so cool and so receptive to, to doing stuff in the ring. And, and yeah, it was cool. We do the title change in Europe, make the fucking people happy. Babe face goes over, fuck, give it back to the heel. It was a good deal. It didn't need the thing long. It, it did what it was accomplished to do. Regal comes out, he's a baby face first, then he does a promo where he turns the crowd. They do the thing, he's beating me up, he's got the fucking heat, you make the comeback, Molly interferes, you beat Regal. One, two, three, people are fucking happy. It was good. What happened the night, I guess it was at WWE New York restaurant, when you got thrown? Oh, that place. Well, like I said, um, WWE New York, like I said, I've, I've been told by, by a lot of the guys, I think Bradshaw, I still, I don't get ribbed about it anymore today, but I'm a good sport. If you can't take getting ribbed, fucking get out of the fucking wrestling business. Because once you get ribbed, if you if you sell a rib or let shit get to you, people are going to keep giving it to you. 
I went out to, we were in Madison Square Garden for Al show, and the restaurant was open there, and fuck, it was free drinks. I like to drink. Fuck, I like to drink at ECW. I got fucking pissed at me for that. I just went there. I don't remember much of it because it's a thing. Sometimes when you go out drinking, music's playing, and you go there, you lose track of, with the music and the sound, you lose track of how much you're drinking. And I'm drinking whiskey, and I'm drinking, and I'm drinking, and I'm talking to people. I'm talking. There wasn't any of the wrestlers in there except me. So obviously all the attention's on me and I'm having a good time and talking to people and people are cool as hell. And I don't remember much. People told me that I threw up and people told me that I got naked. I don't remember. You know, good thing I don't remember. I got a lot of shit for it. That happened actually before King of the Ring. That probably could be the reason why I got taken off TV, you know, points to that. But in some cases, you know, that's pretty ballsy to get fucked up in the boss's restaurant and get crazy, you right. know. But then again, somebody must have liked me because I never lost my job about it. So... You know, like I said, I'd like to tell you more about it, but I don't remember. So, but I mean, I'm like I said, people like it's easy for anyone to look like. Why, why is that guy getting drunk there and doing this? Man, people do stupid shits all the time. Wrestlers aren't exactly the smartest people in the world. They are to some extent, but man, sometimes wrestlers are all more standard. Was it the smartest thing to get drunk at the boss's restaurant? Well, probably not. Should have just went to my fucking hotel and got a bar. But man, you're up there in the company and you're having a good time and you're finally becoming famous and people are recognizing you and it's cool. You go out and you're sociable and the drinks are free. Fuck free is a wrestler's favorite word. I'm not going to turn it down. What was the attitude in the locker room when Vince bought WCW? Oh, man. Remember me and Stevie we used to travel together, you know, and WCW, you never think a company like WCW got a business because they're owned by Turner, you know, and here they are, they're big corporate out of their corporation, that's the word to use, and their attendance, you can just, I read the results or watch the shows, nobody's going to them. I mean, the, the writing there, it's just like, it's, it's mind-boggling, watching the show. Vince buys, you know, watching Shane at WCW, it doesn't seem real. You know, you're watching this, and then the actual idea of them buying this, what are they going to do? How are they going to take this? Where are they going to go? Because here they have something that they can do something with. What are you going to do with it, you know? I think a lot of the feeling of the wrestlers is, I can't speak for any of them. I think the general feeling is you're, most of the guys are scared about spots, that you're going to have to compete for a spot because, you know, here comes all these guys here. Are they coming over here? What's going to happen? You know, we have a meeting where Vince says no one's going to go here, no one's going to go there. I don't think they had a definite idea, but it's, it's, it's really exciting because in one aspect, you know, you just bought your competition. Now, what are you going to do with that name? Or what are you going to do with all those wrestlers? Here's something that's never happened before in the history of the business. So at the end, what's going to happen? Didn't bother me anyway. Fuck, no one's going to take my job. I'm staring at the fucking lights every night. Huh. You know, no one's taking my spot. I wasn't worried about my spot because I wasn't high up in the company. I never in particular been, besides the run I first had, I've never been particularly high up there. I've never been a politicker. I don't mind putting guys over. I love it. I love the fact that they give me guys. Go make them look good. Cool. I'll do it. You know, you think Vince missed a boat? I guess with the uh, interpersonal You know, you can look in hindsight now and say you missed a boat, but it's easy to do that and look back and say, okay, they did the thing where, and man, it was so good on TV with the ECW guys and all the ECW guys turned. Then you had WCW. You can look in hindsight and say, yeah, it's easy to say, yeah, maybe they missed a boat and did this and do that. I wouldn't have wanted that job to write that show. That had been so difficult. Where do you go? Now you have, where do you, where, where if Coke goes, buys Pepsi? Where do you go? How do you do that? It's a different thing because you got wrestlers and you got storyline and ideas, so it's not the same thing. But where do you go? It's easy to look back now and say you missed the boat, he dropped the ball and stuff. But do you fault the guy for buying his competition? No, because now he's they, they can, they're the fucking biggest company in the world. Yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't have wanted to write that show or being involved in those ideas because that that would have been I would never want to write the show because that that's a difficult process of especially when you get your competition. Now you're the only ball game in town. There you go. What did you think when, uh, I guess, the proposed brand extension was brought up? I think it's a good idea. I think it's still a good idea now on aspects. You split the shows. Now they split the pay-per-views. You know, um, it, it's, it's, you have to, you need competition business. They talk about that. So you try to create your own competition. Plus you have so many wrestlers. You know, you have so much damn talent in the company. You want to be able to utilize your talent so therefore you create two shows you make it look like you're having a draft which they are you're having this guys will go here you try to create two separate companies you're still in control of stuff 
you know, I like the concept, but I mean, like I said, people, if they bitch and complain, what would you do? You know, everyone can have their opinions of doing stuff, but here he is, he's in a position, and I, I, I couldn't imagine what's going through his mind, what's the best thing to do to make a dollar? I've got so much talent here, I can't present them on the show, but if I split the shows, maybe I could present certain guys. So it's a very interesting concept. You know, it, it's still playing out right now. Are they going to still stick with it? Where is it going to be in years? You know, where is it going to be down the road? Nobody knows. Were you happy that you were pulling Rolf first? Yeah, I was happy because it was Stevie. I rolled with Stevie. Who? It's it, man, man, Stevie's my best friend, you know, and there, there's very few. I think Jeff Jarrett said, you know, about Owen, you have a lot of acquaintances in this business. There's very few people you can call friends and really confide in. I put Stevie over big. He's been with me through a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff no one knows about. To be able to ride with him and confide with him is good. It didn't, it didn't matter to me about, uh, you know, if I was going to be used on Raw or stuff. You know, they obviously split the companies. They're going to tell the guys you're going to have a lot more opportunity because there's going to be less guys and do stuff, which is cool because, yeah, there can be less opportunity and do stuff. But once again, if somebody likes you, you're going to get used. You know, when I was over on Raw and that, I got used to squiddle stuff. You know, I think Bubba had the hardcore title. I got used for run-ins and doing stuff, which is cool, because I got to be a goof and do stuff with comedy, but I I never was used over on Raw. That's why they traded me over to SmackDown. I think originally they were supposed to have me on SmackDown, because this is where they have all the cruiserweights. Right. But then I guess somebody had the idea, well, we're going to have the hardcore title there, so maybe we could use them there. But it just never happened. They put you on heat for a while, too. Put me on heat as far as for just... just it seemed like before they went to uh, SmackDown... Did I was working heat? Yeah. yeah, I just, I work I worked heat and, and didn't work eye heat, though. That's a show. International heat's a show to work. Ask Tommy about that. <laughs> you know, I worked heat. I worked, it, it didn't, work, working heat is, is a lot less stressful than working raw. Working raw is so damn stressful in the sense, not that I don't welcome the challenge of working it, but it's like, if I'm going to work this show, it's, it's more stressful because it's live, and then I have to know I'm going to get my match cut on time. That shit always fucking happens. And then you're on a level of working raw where guys are politicking for spots, and it's a very stressful thing. When you work heat, you're not going to get your time cut. When you work heat, it's a more relaxed atmosphere. You know, I was content with doing that, and I never politicked for anything. And I think they just pretty much, someone came up with the idea, well, we're not doing shit with Crash. Fuck, we got to do something with him. He's, he's got something to offer. Well, fuck, why don't we put him on? We should have put him on SmackDown originally. We got all the cruiserweights there. That's where I think the concept would have happened. Put me over there. Who you know I'm being put with uh, Matt Hardy and Shannon Moore? You know what? I, I, I was so... Matt had that idea from Attitude. But the whole version one thing. Here's somebody... Man, this is another case of something where people tell people, you know what? You're not going to be a wrestler. Here are people, and Matt knows more than anyone, Jeff's carrying the Hardys. Jeff is the fucking Hardys, you know? People do the comparisons in the beginning of the Hardys where Jeff is like Shawn Michaels and Matt's like the fucking Marty Jeanette. Right. So what does Matt do? Matt comes up with fucking catchphrases and saying and gives and he sticks it up everyone's ass because Matt's good shit's so good. He comes up with it and he comes up and gets so fucking good at problems. You know, he creates a character that he created that they ran with, you know? And when they put him with Shannon, man, I was so fucking happy because I love those guys. They're great. It was good shit, man. It was entertaining. I had a... I was over on SmackDown. I started doing stuff when... Is Jay, I don't even know if Jamie Noble was cousins with fucking Nunzio. They said he was, but I don't know. You know, they said... I started out with that. It was cool because when Nunzio came in, I was involved with that, but then I had a cyst on my tailbone. So if anyone's ever had a cyst, it is the most painful fucking thing in the world to get your cyst drained. I had that where I was out about a month and a half and I was sitting home and they didn't have any ideas for me. Actually, prior to that, before I had the, uh, the cyst, one of the writers said, would you like to be with Matt and Shannon? I said, fuck yeah, I'd love to be with them because I thought they're so good as a team and I thought I could help offer something to them, you know. Being put with Matt and Shannon, it just... I like to joke with Shannon that we were Team Icicle. Kind of like that character, what's that character in Monsters, Inc.? Was it Sully? When he did the thing and they walked through the door and they were in the North Pole or the other one? That's the kind of heat me and Shannon brought to the ring. <laughs> we didn't have any heat as heels. You know, a lot of people are like, they'll watch a show or they write, like I said, my big thing on the internet, you know, people don't have a clue. Like, they write stuff. You know, this guy sucks, get rid of him. This guy's a jobber, you know? Think about me. My, my thing I'm worried about a jobber, to me, someone is a jobber, those guys in the 80s who used to get crushed, crumbled, and stomped on fucking the show. You know, I don't think anyone's particular jobber today because everyone has talent up there. 
You know, Jobber's a guy, to me at least back in the 80s, who didn't have a horrible body, or had nothing to offer, who wasn't really, didn't have a lot of experience, and just got his ass handed to him. The guys up there today have experience. It's amazing that, you know, someone like Jamie Noble, how they won't even use that guy, you know? He sat there for so long before they gave him the new gimmick. It's like, why don't you give that guy? It's, it's amazing that Jamie Noble would sit there. It's mind-boggling to me that they would sit there. The thing about me and being with Shannon is, like, they put us together, and I didn't understand because here we are. They gave us a pre-tape of Velocity, which I thought came out really good. Crowd responded good, you know? We never wrestled once a six-man tag at all. We were never featured there. I didn't understand. I asked questions why. They, it's never it's never an explanation. Like Kind of like up there, like the writers up there, it's kind of like the Al-Qaeda Writers Network. And I mean Al-Qaeda's Writers Network is you never get a direct answer to what is going on. There's so many hidden cells. Huh. You know, and the agents, like you try to ask questions and like, why is this going on? Okay, we're six man, but we never tag. And this is the answer you get all the time. And they walk away. You never get an answer to shit, you know. I'd present ideas and stuff. I, I thought I thought we had good chemistry as six men where we could have been used and could have helped the show. I felt so bad for Matt because it seemed like when they put me with those guys, they fucking turned into a six man jobber crew. We didn't do shit, you know. It was and it was disappointing because the point when we come in there, I was so excited. But as the weeks go on, it's mind boggling to me because we do the thing with Ray, you know. Me and Shannon go out there and we do a handicap match with Ray. I didn't understand the handicap match in one aspect because I don't mind putting over Ray. Fuck, I'll put over anyone. But if Ray's going to beat two guys at once, who gives a shit if we're going to wrestle Ray down the line because he already beat us both at once? But okay, that's cool. You want to do that? That's cool. Ray got hurt in the match. I felt so fucking bad. He, he, he pulled a fucking groin or his hamstring, but we finished the match. Then he gets to wrestle Matt. Matt, Matt wrestles Ray. They have, one, they have the highest rated segment on the fucking show. It was awesome, you know? We actually got to go out there and get heat. The only time we've ever gone out and got heat. Me and Shannon sliding, give him a double team. Ray still kicks out. The match was fucking great. It was the highest rated thing. Matt's happy. I'm happy. Shannon happy. Cool. This, maybe we showed him. Here we go. Give him some. What do they do for next week? Matt wrestles Ray in the opener of a show. I thought the match was even better. I thought the psychology was good. The little things they did were really fucking good. Even though me and Shannon don't get to go out with Matt, Matt still lays us out in the back. It's kind of like the shit that... Me and Bob used to do, but in a different way to where Matt's a dickhead and we're just a fucking... I like the idea because Shannon, um, um, Shannon's a lackey and he's teaching me the lackey. The lackey's lackey, you know? It could have been such good entertaining shit, but unless you get the ball and somebody likes you, you're never going to be able to run. And they never gave us the idea. So what's the reward for Matt after he has the matches with Ray? Well, next week, Matt gets to wrestle as a local and we wrestle the Bashams. It didn't make any sense to me. I was so disappointed because I thought... We could offer the show something good. And me, at least, I saw that. You know, it was very frustrating being put with those guys and never getting to do something. I don't. I think we're the only six man in the world ever never to tag. <laughs> you know, I think we are. I think we hold our. And me and Shannon, I think we tagged with house shows or TV maybe five times. We fucking lost everyone. And it's not a matter of losing. It's a matter of, like I said, the character from Monsters Incorporated. We had no heat as heels. And if we're heels. Let us get some heat on someone. We don't have to beat anyone and go over them, but you have to establish his heels through pre-tapes and stuff in the back. And right. it was just, to me, it was a disappointment because I think that's one of the times where I felt, man, that they'd fucking drop the ball with this big time. I felt that. They did. I did. I wasn't willing to do anything. When I had ideas or Matt did or Shannon did. They just, nothing happened. Thoughts on the gimmick of uh, reading the book upside down? That's, that's, that's a case in point where I thought, you know, we had the pre-tape. And we thought about the pre-tape. It's had a basis for what they want us to say, you know. And we were bouncing ideas. I think I, I think Matt, Matt had the idea that I read the book upside down, you know, or maybe Shannon did have the book. We were bouncing ideas. We thought it was funny shit. And the crowd really responded to the pre-tape. And to me, I thought it was so good because well, here's the takeoff. Let's see it. And to me, it just makes sense because it's right up my alley. I'm an idiot. Why wouldn't you? The little things make the difference. Reading the book upside down, it's just a little thing. Or just standing out there and reading the book. That's the little shit that helps get something over. It helps get Matt over. I'm trying to learn about attitude. Let me read the book. You know, reading the book is people are gonna remember that more than doing a move in the ring, doing something fancy, going along with the gimmick to help get Matt over and Shannon and the six man over. You know? 
Did you ever get any heat for leaving, I guess, shows early after your matches? No, I never got any heat. You know, they, they start they started talking about that. The guys should, and they have a point where guys should stay to the end and you should learn and watch at the end what do the thing. Well, I think the boys' aspect on that is if we have a show and we have to drive and, you know, it's, it's are you talking about house shows or TV? TV. TV would work how, like, you'd have, if you had a pay-per-view or something, which you should watch everything on a pay-per-view, I think where it used to be, I mean, they, they fire up every now and then. You should stay to the end of the show because guys are leaving and they take it as a disrespect that right. you guys are leaving. You could actually stay and learn. I think the aspect on some of the guys is that, you know, we have so many shows per year. You know, I'm watching, I'm learning. Most of the guys know that if you're asked to do the job and get the job done, whatever ask in front of you, they can do it. So it's like, why do we got to stay to the end? Because it, there's no off season. So I think a lot of the guys attitudes, I want to get to the next town, you know, and if it's a house show and it's the second or third day of the house show, I've already seen this match. Okay. Maybe they might do something new, but I think the aspect is since we do so many shows week in and week out and week in and week out, you just want to get to the next town. You know, it's not a disrespect to anything. It's a good point to, Watch because you can learn from the opening guy to the main event. You can learn by watching anything, but I think most of the guys' attitude is, I'd like to get to the next town. You know, it's not a disrespect, but they're, if they're the bosses and they're going to lay the law down, you got to fucking do what they're saying. I never got any heat for it. All right. Why did you end up leaving out of WWE? It's kind of like the thing that talk of the, where, you know, it, it said what on there, it said on the company's website, and I said I wanted to pursue other interests. The other interests I want to pursue, I want to pursue things that, that doesn't make sense to me there anymore. You know, I just, I don't understand there anymore. And the other interest I want to pursue, it's, it's sanity. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't happy there in some aspects. And it's not about going over and winning and doing stuff. It's about, I wasn't happy in the aspect of like, man, I just, I don't, I don't understand this place. Where, where are you going with this direction? I can't pretend to understand. I just I wanted to pursue things that, that made sense to me. And I always felt... If I ever wake up and I say, I got to go do go to work, if I ever started saying that, it's time to move on. And I got to a point where the last few weeks there, I felt like driving to the airport in Charlotte. It's like, I got to go to work. I even caught myself saying to Stevie on the phone, I was like, you know what? It's just, I, I just got to do something else. Were you surprised? No, no I, wasn't, I wasn't surprised at all. I, I, I expressed to them and I talked to them and they... They, they understood where I was coming from, and, and it was fine. It wasn't, it wasn't a shock to me that they let me go, and it's exactly what they said, pursue other interests. What's your opinion on uh, some of the current WWE writers? <laughs> I wouldn't want the writer's job. Yeah, I've, I've even told the writers this. I wouldn't want your job because, you know, they work such long, hard hours. And you can talk to Tommy, you know. You work such long, hard hours, and maybe they have good ideas, you know. I'm sure some of their ideas are good, but how can you – Write a wrestling show if you've never been involved, if you've never been a wrestler or haven't been involved in the business. You know, like Dave Lagana. You know, here comes Dave Lagana, and Dave writes for the show Friends. Sometimes it seemed like Dave would be more worried about how he can get Ross and Rachel back together than he would be about writing a good wrestling show. To me, it was mind-boggling that, like I said, it's not my company. I don't make the decisions, but I, I to me at least, you would hire someone with wrestling experience. Hiring guys who aren't involved in wrestling just to write a show is mind-boggling to me. You know, my opinion of the writers is I don't have an opinion on them because I don't respect them because, you know, I don't kiss anyone's ass. You know, that's not me. I'm straightforward. I'm cool. You got something to do. Do it. Let's do it. Sometimes even a lot of the writers, they they have good intentions for wanting to do stuff. And they tell you they're going to do an idea and you're getting set to do the idea. And the next week, it doesn't happen. Why didn't it happen? Probably because it got changed or maybe something else happened. So I don't really have an opinion of the writers other than the fact that, if if the writing's bad right now, which to me it seems like it doesn't it doesn't make sense to me at least it doesn't. I wish somebody would explain to me where they're going because I don't understand it. It is horrible. Uh, do you think they had any idea what to do with your character? And if you had control of your character, what would you have done differently? I think the the aspect is like I like I like doing comedy. I like being an idiot or, or doing stuff at, at my own. I like being an idiot in my own expense and doing stupid shit. I don't think I think sometimes they get. They get tired of, of things quickly. It's kind of like, here's a theory. And bring this up. You watch the Grammys this year? Do you watch the Grammys? No. Okay. You know who Nora Jones is? I have no idea. You have Nora Jones? What did Nora Jones do with the Grammys? 
She won them. She won every fucking award she was noted for. Nora Jones was nominated for five Grammys, and she won five fucking awards. Do you even hear Nora Jones on the radio anymore? No. And here's the thing about Nora Jones. It's the same thing about wrestling. Wrestling is based on perception. You know, I have to perceive certain things. It's a fake business, but it's real because through angles and issues, I'm going to perceive certain things. Nora Jones, all they talk about, oh, she's got a great voice. Oh, she's got a great voice. This Nora Jones is great. They talk about how great she is. Nora Jones only had one song playing on the radio, which was like a fucking elevator song to me. It was slow. It was boring. She has a great voice, but she sweeps the Grammys. She beats out Eminem. She beats out uh, Avril Lavigne. She beats out all these fucking people who are getting a ton of more airplay and more people are into. And what does that do for Nora Jones? Well, the perception is she's good. And what does that do? That increases her album sales next week. You know, what's the question again? I was kind of going off on that. Basically what you would have done with your character and all that. And what I would have done with my character is they wanted to be me. They wanted me to be more serious. You know, be more serious when I'm out there. Well, I can't be more serious. I came in the company Karen scale. Why don't you let me be the idiot? There's a room for comedy. A lot of people don't like to do comedy because they like to remain strong. I respect that. Like I said, I'm not Team Angle or Benoit. I can't be as intense as those guys, but I'll give you Comedy Central and you can laugh at my own expense. I would have, I would have. You know, for me, at least, let me do my strong points. Let me be the sarcastic idiot. You know, let me be in, in little points and help get shit over. You know, I just think a lot of times, if you have a, like a CD collection, you know, if you have 50 CDs, and man, you're so excited, you got a brand new one, and you're playing with the brand new one, and you're not listening to anything over here, maybe Eminem's here, and Avril Lavigne's here, and there's a market for that, but now that you're tired with this one, you put it on the shelf, and that's the aspect of wrestling. It's like toys. I want to play with that new toy, and when I'm done playing with it, you're done with your spot. Here comes the new toy. Even though there's a market for that one, that guy can help you out. It's who likes you and who wants to do something with you, not how much talent and ability you have. You know? I'll say, uh, what was I talking about? I was talking about the Grammys. I'll say one more thing uh, about when they released me and everything. I'm not, I'm very happy they did it. You know? It was, it was, it was a mutual thing. I knew it was coming. It was a mutual thing. I know where I got my start. I know Vince made me a name. And that's why people know me today. When I go work places, it's because Vince put the TV time into me, and I respect all the McMahons, because the McMahons, are, they're, they're getting the ring. Vince gets in the ring. He's crazy. You know, Shane, they're crazy. Not in a bad way, but in a good way. I respect them because I made mean, living there, and I got my start there, and I, like I said, I don't hold any ill feelings toward them. And that's no bullshit. They let me go. I like the, like the terms they let me go. That's cool with me. And I think some people get caught in the aspect that they believe their character. You know, they believe they're that person. They believe they created that. They believe they won that belt. It's a fucking work, you know? But I respect the McMahons for giving me my start there. I would never rule out working there again. Oh, yeah, I would never rule out working there again. And the wrestling business is so crazy. They might call me next week and say, would you want to come in and work? But just right now, that place, I just mentally, I don't know if I can handle working there. Who are some of your favorite guys you like to work with there? Funaki, hands down. I, if I could work Funaki every night for the rest of my career, I'd work Funaki. I was funny because I did one of the website guys there. I did an interview. I said it as a joke. I said, I bet if I say this, I bet I get to work Funaki. I said, I don't care if it takes every night of my career for the rest of my life. Funaki, I don't care. I'll beat you. And I just did a thing. And the next thing you know, I'm over in Europe and I wrestled Funaki on the pay-per-view. So it was just, I love working Funaki because he's so easy. you know. And my thing about working guys is is I like the guys who are easy, who aren't going to hurt you and beat the fuck out of you in the ring, you know. And not particularly anyone's there is going to beat the fuck of me. It's not that I can't take it. It's just some guys are more physical than others. Some guys have their shit they like to get in. I like to work guys like a Funaki or, or Spanky. I love to work in Spanky. You know, even Jamie Noble, I love him to death, but man, Jamie Noble is a potato machine. He'll fucking potato death, but I, I love Jamie. I, I wrote, That's my riding partners actually was Jamie and Bill DeMont be, before uh, Bill got hurt. I was out there, but just, I'm more comfortable, actually, the guys I'm more comfortable with, it's funny you asked that question, I was thinking about that today, because I was wondering, so what questions is he going to ask me? The guys I like working with are the cruiserweights, because I think the cruiserweights identify with each other, because you know how hard it is to get to a company like that. You know when you're small, you don't have as much chance as a bigger guy up there. So you can identify with each other because it's like you're the same breed and putting the matches together with the cruiserweights are so much easier to bounce ideas off because you're just safe because it's like working with yourself. You're working with a midget. You right. Know? What was Bill like outside Bill who? DeMont? Yeah. Bill DeMont. I, I talk to Bill a few times a week. Bill DeMont's personality. Bill DeMont has the most natural charisma and personality out of anyone. He's so fucking funny. When I saw him on top enough, remind me of Bubba. Bill on Tough Enough is the way Bill thinks he should teach. Bill the person, if anybody knows Bill, he's the most sarcastic, funniest fucking natural funny. 
He's kind of like Bobby Heaton, so quick-witted. Bill is just such a natural life fucking character. It just, there's no way once you get to know Bill that you can't love him. You know, I love Bill DeMont to death. It's just, I feel bad because Bill, in a case like Bob Holly, he just never got to that point in his career that maybe he should have. But that's the part about wrestling's fake, that you need that person in your corner. And Bill's never got that, you know, he's got jerked around left and right. He's worked, I don't know, 10, 11 years, maybe 12. And just, I feel bad for Bill because he should get that one run in there. You know, I love Bill to death. What's Triple H like? Behind the scenes. Triple H, I never, I never had any conversations with Triple H. You know, people, people like to talk about him. Obviously, the internet likes to talk about him. They like to bury him. You know, Triple H doing this, that. But the thing about Triple H is, I don't know anything about the guy. I know he's there. He's if I wanted to talk to him, he would talk to me. If I wanted to talk to any of the guys, I never, I never had conversations with Austin. I think maybe one since I was there. I never had conversations with Brock. I just certain guys I would migrate to and talk to. Than other guys, the main guys. If you want to talk to them, they're approachable. I just never, never talked to them. Think about Triple H. As much criticism as he gets, I mean, he, he. What would you do if you were in his spot? Most of the guys in there, if they had his spot and they were doing it, what would they do? Right. You know, they might do some of the same stuff he does. I don't know what he does. You obviously hear shit that it's like, oh, he's doing this and he's holding guys back. Here's a funny one that I always fucking see, and it's like they're holding Jericho back. Fucking Jericho main event at WrestleMania. You know, Jericho's always on TV. He's always involved in some. I think even he himself came out and said he's accomplished everything he wants to do. So what exactly are guys getting held back against? I mean, he's holding guys back and doing so I don't see I don't see with Triple H because he's never I was never gonna work him, you know, unless it was a match like Maven got to work him recently, unless it was something like that. He never Never bothered me, never did nothing. I never had any feelings towards him. I guess you have to, you get to know somebody to, to judge stuff. I hear stuff, like everybody hears stuff, but fuck, I don't know if it's true. You know, like I said, if you were in his position and you were that, I think Stephanie herself came out and said they were dating. Well, if you were in his spot, what would you do? Right. You know, it's like the same thing. If my, if, if I'm, I got my wife, you know, obviously you're going to have more say so in things than other people. And the guys are pissed. What are you pissed about? That's the nature of the business. You know, it's who knows you, it's who likes you. You can't get pissed at that. It's a business, you know? What are you going to do? Did you ever have any inter interaction with Vince at all? I've had maybe three conversations with Vince. More two towards the end of things. You know, I had one about, it was the Toronto WrestleMania. You know, when they're having the 24-7. And I didn't think I was working, but I got to the building and they were doing a 24-7 match there. I was a little pissed because if this is a rule that started with me, to me it just makes sense to have me in it. Let me help get somebody over. I was pissed about that. I expressed I was pissed to him. He understood about that. They put me in the match. I got to do something with Spike. It was good. I didn't, I didn't care to go over or do something. I care, man, if I was the guy that you chose to do this and if you're going to follow the storylines, if I'm the idiot who said, the titles on the line 24-7. Yeah, I went to different guys. Raven did something, you know. You give it to Big Show. The rule floated around, and it stuck around a long time, you know. But if it's going to be at a WrestleMania, not just because it's, say, I want to be involved in WrestleMania. Any wrestler wants to be involved there. So I expressed I was disappointed. I want to be involved. He knew that. I talked to Briscoe about that. I had that conversation with Vince about that. He, he's If you want to talk to him, he'll talk to you. You know, he he just, I expressed to him about the, the Matt and the Shannon thing. I just didn't understand where things were going on, he, he didn't understand either. Do you, you think know? he follows his own product? Do you think it's pretty much he's got so much to deal with that he doesn't watch his own product? I don't, I don't, man, that guy has so much to deal with. I couldn't even, I mean, that's what me saying, but I mean, man, who'd want to be in his shoes? You know, it's easy to look. People are so easy to look. And like, the thing about Triple H, well, I'll go back to Vince, thing about, it's like when the Dallas Cowboys or a sports team is winning, you know, people don't like that. People don't like, they want to see somebody fall. Right. You know, wrestling business is different, but they'll look at some people like Triple H. Why doesn't he drop the fucking belt? Why doesn't he do the right thing for business? Why doesn't that? Nobody likes someone who's on top. Everybody wants to see that motherfucker fall off the apron. You know, to me, it's it's, it's just a natural thing. People like underdogs. People like to see him. People say, well, Jericho deserves this or this guy deserves that. Nobody deserves anything in the wrestling business. You get lucky and you get something through when somebody likes you or just timing or just anything. Fucking Vince. I wouldn't want to be in Vince's shoes, you know? I respect the hell of the guy for giving me my start. But man, that guy, he is such a workaholic. Who would wanna who would wanna run that asylum with all those people and all those problems? 
Fuck, man. I, I would not. And like I said, anybody who sits there and they, they think they could do a better job than Vince, you're fucking crazy. You know, he, he I couldn't imagine the day to day operations and the stuff he has to deal with. He can't take a day off. Why don't you tell people that when people talk about criticizing? You realize that man can't take a day off. Never, ever take a day off for the rest of his life. As long as he won't take a day off. He's so dedicated. Right, right. You know? Jim Ross, what's he like in your opinion on him? Jim Ross has a tough spot too because he's in charge of, of talent relations. He's got to deal with people with constant problems or days off or this, that, and the other. Uh, Jim Ross as a commentator is, is is one of the best. You know, Jim Ross, I've never had never had conversations with Jim Ross. I've never been one. It was always amazing to me these people that I'd see on a daily basis. And even like Vince, I wouldn't see him for, I'd see him every day, but I'd never sit down and have conversations with him. Not that he has to be my friend, because it's a business, but it would always amaze me, man, I see these people, they don't know anything about me, you know? That was always amazing to be about the company. How bad has Morale gotten in the WWE locker room? I, th I think it, it's, it's, it's confusion because, you know, I'll try to relate it to when a sports team's winning, Everybody's happy. Man, the Yankees are winning. You're winning World Series. And you're fucking selling out everywhere. Everybody's happy. Eh, there's not a problem in the world. But business goes in cycles. You know, up and down and up and down. It's a down cycle right now. What's the answer to the problems? Fuck, I don't know. You know, nobody knows. You know, it can, yeah, people can sit there and point, well, it should be this. It should be that. It should be this. It should be that. Fuck, no one has a direct answer to that. I think the morale there is, I think it's more, I can't speak for anybody. I just see a look of confusion upon people's faces because it's, how do you turn things around? You know, you definitely have the talent to turn things around. How do you turn it around? I, I think you turn it around, my opinion at least, is with good writing. And I think Ben said it too, we're not giving the people what they want. He always comes out and says in interviews, why is business down? We gotta give the people what they want. We gotta find out what the people want to see because the people control it. Wrestling is controlled by people. That's the only, we can't put on a show unless there's people there. Unless you're having an empty arena match with fucking well, Rock. Yeah, yeah, you know, but that's controlled. They have to find what the people want and the writing right now, to me at least, it is what the people want. The ratings show it and the arena show it, you know, but you can't speak up and say some of this stuff because it's honesty. When you're honest in the wrestling business, Sometimes people don't like that. You have to kind of go with the flow on things. Right. You know. What do you see in uh, the future for yourself? Um, I'm, I'm only 31. I, I'm not, I don't have any career threatening injuries. I've had my share of injuries just like anybody else. I think uh, I have something to offer. You know, I think I, I like to think that I was lucky enough to, to be able to create something to where when people think of, of me and the WWF and, and that company in the last five years, they'd smile. They think, man, that guy's a fucking idiot. You never know what that guy's gonna do. I think that's an element that you can add to any show or any promotion because you have so many guys with, with different abilities. You have intensity here or guys who are awesome wrestlers. You have this. I can do a little bit of stuff, but I can be that comic idiot. Like so many times people, people wanna remain, a lot of times, the mentality of some of the wrestlers is, I want to remain strong. You know, I got to remain strong, and that's the way. That's cool if you want to do that, but I'm not going to convince anyone I'm strong. I could be Comedy Central. That's fucking easy for me because I can feel it out there, and I'll do it all day long. Though. And you know what? It works for the most part because people like to laugh. Who doesn't like to laugh at someone who's looking like an idiot in the ring? Or just fucking gets whacked real quick or do something ridiculously. It's kind of like the thing I did with, with Rikishi. I went out there. It was a velocity match. They had magazines in the back. They had like 12 of them. And that was on the cover. And no one told me to do this. And this is the aspect I like about that, that company. At some points, you get the freedom on some ends to have input and say stuff. I took the magazines out to the ring. And I surrounded the ring. You know, put 12 magazines out. I told Rikishi, you're surrounded with matitude. Little things come, things like that. Like you just laughed right there. Things that make somebody laugh. I don't care. Rikishi's going to beat me. It's not the point. It's the point of the little things that make the difference and making somebody laugh. That's that's what I like about wrestling. I think wrestling serves an important purpose. I think I can serve. And it, is, it might sound weird to hear this. Wrestlers and someone like myself, I serve an important purpose to society because I entertain you. When you have your lousy day or you got your shitty job or you're pissed off or maybe you got a fight with your woman and here's a wrestling show on TV or you come and you pay your money to watch me on the show, you're gonna laugh, you know? 
I might not be the kind of character you like. I may not be the high-flying cruiserweight, but at least I don't think I'm boring, and at least you laugh at something out there with me. And I think I work hard. I bust my ass out there just like anyone else does because I want to entertain people and make them laugh. Laugh at my expense. Man, the world can be such a shitty place, but if I can make you laugh, and more importantly, if I can pop boys in the back, I've done my job. Name game. I'll just dive into the name game. You get a couple words, whatever. Uh, China. Uh, China? Let me see. You want like one word names or just like anything? Uh, I got to work with her. Uh, like I said, I don't. I saw her match with Chono. Huh. <laughs> no comment on the match. You know, I didn't understand the match at all. Like I said, she's she's someone that, that was such a big star here, but much like a lot of the big stars here when they leave. And, I think she tried to, I don't know what the reasons exactly why she left, but when she, she had so many good deals going on with sitcoms, and then when she left, she tried to be an actress, nothing happened for her. Sometimes when you leave this company, you don't have a machine behind you. You don't got that big end machine, so you can't get your foot in the door in those places. You know, she's talented. She was fucking over when she was here. You know, she got a lot of criticism while she did this wrong, but you know, but you don't need to have, not to be the perfect wrestler to get shit over. She had a presence out there that she was, and she was fucking over when she was here. Raven. Raven, I love, I love Scotty. Scotty's fucking, Scotty drives other people to the wall. I fucking love Raven. Raven's somebody who's, who was here. My favorite, one of my favorite Raven matches with him, with the one with Rhino, you know? I actually had a good hardcore match with him in Pittsburgh. Molly was involved. We've been good with Molly wasn't there. She ate all the food. No, no, it was a good match with Raven. Raven's got a good mind. Uh, he, he has good fucking ideas. Uh, you know, he's, he's talented. You know, he was somebody that was in this company that unless somebody likes you, they don't use you. So what did Raven did? He sat on heat doing nothing. Raven has more to offer than that. It shows in TNA. It shows when you go to the independence and watch him. He's got talent. And Raven, Raven's somebody that has that it factor. You know what I mean? It's like when I go, used to, when I go watch, it's not on level this, but it's something like this. When I used to go watch war games and the guys used to come out to the ring, and here comes Arn, and here comes this guy, here comes Flair. Something about the guy when he walks through the fucking curtain, you know? It's got that it's got that it factor that you can't explain. You either have it or you don't. Raven's got that it factor that when he walks in the building or he's in the ring with his presence and his movement, whatever it is about him, he's got it. It's a shame he wasn't utilized by the company more, but that's just the nature of the business, but he's getting to show some of that that you know, yeah, look at his fucking career and the right. stuff he's done, you know? Uh, Cactus Jack. Cactus Jack, uh, my, my opinion of him is, is, I have split opinion of him. My opinion on him is, is he's a legend. He, he did a lot for, for the business. He, he's, opinion of him would change because I'm a father. Something I don't like about the beyond the mat thing. And like I said, people put over Mick left and right. This is the only thing I, I won't put over about him. And there's two things actually. I didn't like the fact that beyond the map that he stuck his kid in the third row or whatever. I have a daughter, and wrestling business is tough as it is, and I, I keep my daughter away from it. To me, at least, as a parent, if I was bleeding, get my head bashed in, I wouldn't want my daughter to see it. To me, that was disturbing. To me, it was disgusting. I didn't like that. You know, I don't, I don't know why he would do that. You know, it doesn't take away from any of his accomplishments in the ring, you know. He, he, I, I love the way he sold, you know, he sold fucking good. And some of the best parts where he got over was when he used comedy. It wasn't going off the top of the cage or the thumbtacks. That got him to be a legend as far as for the hardcore point. But the part about comedy when he pulled the sock out is what got him over. Mm -hmm. To me, at least, got him over that to the next level of being an entertainer thing. The thing about the kid bugs me just because I'm a parent and I try to shield my kid away from certain things like that. And when I see something like that, that's just disgusting to me, you know. Stephanie McMahon. Stephanie McMahon, um, I've, I've only had like one conversation with her. She's always very approachable. Let's talk ideas. I mean, like I said, I don't have anything, I don't have anything bad to say about the McMahons. How can I say anything bad about a family that provided me for a living? How can I say anything bad about a company regardless of whether I work there and I don't work there now? How can I go and bury the fucking McMahons when you provided me with a living and gave me a stage to entertain people. I can't say anything bad about them. Obviously, when you don't work for a company anymore, it's like a breakup or a bad relationship. Things aren't going the way you want, so that's why you don't work in a place. I don't know if uh, Jerry Lawler said it in a book. I think it might have been his book. Wrestlers are like head coaches. You're hired to be fired. If you're a wrestler and you work for a company, 
especially a company like that, you will be let go one day. Pretty much that's a fact. You know, you have to face fact. You don't think about it, especially when you go in there and things are going good. Like when I go in there and business is good and it's up here, then all of a sudden things go during down here. Well, I don't think anything about other man, and they're all crazy. They get in the fucking ring. Every one of them get in the ring. They don't have to get in the ring. You know, I think who said it? Terry Funk said that fucking Vince McMahon is hardcore because he fucking gets in the ring. He doesn't have to do that. You have your your workers to get in the ring. So how can he say anything bad about people? Undertaker. He, well, what can you say? He's been around forever. He's the one else who people bury. Same time as the guy. How can you bury the fucking guy? And plus, too, look at the reaction that the guy gets. You don't have to be the greatest to do anything, but for someone who's his size, he fucking moves around. He's one of the most approachable guys in the locker room. He's very down to earth. I've never had a conversation with him. I got to work with him one time. Me and Bob got to tag up with him against Edge Christian. I forget the other participant. But, I mean, he, he's absolutely great. He's, he's very approachable. And the fucking guy's been on top forever. What are you going to say? And, he's, and people who say stuff like, people sometimes, my thing about people who bury certain people is out of jealousy. I've always said that the people on the internet or some of the fans, you'll bury the wrestlers because you like certain aspects of that wrestler's life. You like fame or money or you wish you could get that response that Undertaker can get, but you never will. So you're just an armchair fan. So he's done everything. He's been everywhere, and he still gets a fucking awesome reaction when he comes out. Is there anything you want to say to your fans out there before we... Um, you know what? I have I have a love or hate relationship with the fans. I think a lot of times Lance Storm had a commentary about fans who are pushy and ask for autographs. I think a lot of times, since we're on TV so much, you can't separate the wrestler from the person. So when you see someone in the airport, a lot of times people say really stupid shit. Not that they mean to, but just you're so amazed that you see this person in person, you know, that you, you're stunned, you know. I think the American fans, and I've, I've heard with Mike and Dom talk about Japanese fans are different, but the American fans at least sometimes get a bad taste in my mouth because they're really pushy. You know, I can count, I'll give it two hands now, on the times that have been approached, like, I don't mean to bug you. And you're probably busy. Would you please, please sign this autograph? You you can ask most of the boys that too. You rarely get approached with a please or a genuine compliment or something. Sometimes you get the thing, hey, where's Rocket? Where's the Rocket? Where's this? Funny story I'll tell you uh, is, is I won the thing. And this is where I just, I fire back on the fans. I'm there with, with Spanky and Jamie Noble. And we're sitting down at Applebee's. This was actually last week. It was the Washington House Show before the last week I was in the company and we're sitting down there at the restaurant and one of the guys came up, he was really nice. And when this girl waitress comes up, she goes, oh my God, you go, where's Matt Hardy? Where's Matt Hardy? So I said, well, where's the good looking waitresses at? I just give it right back to the fans. Yeah. You know, it just, uh, think about the fans, I appreciate it. I'm not an idiot. I know without the fans coming there that, you know, you couldn't make a living with them. I just wish on some aspects that sometimes I think it's hard to get carried away, you know, that you should, Man, a genuine compliment will get you more farther. That's why I think a lot of wrestlers snap because you're on the road constantly throughout the year. You don't get a break. Man, you can go to any of the boys up there right now and say, where were you two weeks ago? Who'd you work? And they'll do this. Um, it'd be amnesia one-on-one. Oh, uh, that's why a lot of times you just have so much. And sometimes I think maybe the guys snap on the fans when they shouldn't. I know I've done it, you know. But I just hope that, uh, like I said, for the fans, I, I hope that, that I've, I've entertained people. If anything up there, I may not be your favorite character. I just hope I've entertained you and I hope I can continue to entertain with the people. I hope I give you something where I put a smile on their face and you know, I might not be the best at doing everything, but I try, you know, and I appreciate the people coming out and that have supported, you know, and things will turn around. Business is down here, but it'll turn around, you know. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thanks.